morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is September 26th. It's the Select Budget Committee. It's day two up here. And I'm Sally Bagshaw. I chair this committee. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez, for being here with me. And we are moving forward today with presentations from our departments. I want to thank everybody for participating yesterday. We heard from uh, Ben Noble, our city budget office discussion. We also had Mommy Hara and Deborah Smith from our Seattle Public Utilities and Seattle City Lights. So uh, thank you for that good first session. We have both a morning and an afternoon session today. At the conclusion of the morning session, we're going to recess and then come back at 2 p.m. And public comment will be at the end of the second group this afternoon. So uh, I appreciate very much people coming and for the clerk's office clarifying that public comment is at the end of the day. This morning, we're going to receive presentations from our Office of Economic Development. I want to welcome Bobby Lee. This is our first budget with you. Um, we're excited to hear from you. We are also going to have the Department of Parks and Recreation, and I assume Jesus Aguirre. Um, perhaps Christopher Williams will be here to join us, and we'll hear from the Office of Labor Standards. This afternoon, we've got three other departments, our Human Services Department, Office of Housing, and the Department of Education and Early Learning. So um, many of you know that our Office of Human Services has been working extensively on helping people who are homeless, but I know it doesn't come as a surprise to thank you for the three people who are at the table. You know this, but Office of Human Services, hello. Deborah Juarez, thank you for being here. Council Member Abel Pacheco, thank you as well. Human Services does a lot more than address the needs of people who are homeless. And we're going to have a special session next week where we're focusing really on a deep dive on homelessness and all of the programs that our uh, other departments are working on, whether it's parks or our fire, fire department, first responders, and so on. But today, when this afternoon, when we hear from Human Services, and I'll mention it again at the, um, at the end of this presentation, is that Office of Human Services also has um, departments that work on promoting healthy aging, youth employment, affordability and livability, responding to gender-based violence. So those are the areas that we're going to focus on today. So if you don't hear anything about human services working with our people who are homeless and the needs there, know that that is coming next week. So with that, um, just want to remind our public that the first of two public hearings during the budget process will be October 3rd. That's a Thursday. And the second public hearing will be on Tuesday, October 22nd. Both of the public hearings will be here and will begin at 530. So unless anybody has any questions, we're going to dive in today. Again, Bobby Lee, thank you for being here and welcome to all. And I think, Yolanda, we're going to start with you, but let's have introductions so that we all know who's here. Yolanda Ho, Council Central Staff. Tom Mikesell, Central Staff. I think I have to turn this on. It's, uh, it's, it's on the ID. stem, Bobby, and it should be a green light on. I think it's on. It's on. Good. Okay. Bobby Lee with OED. Great. Amanda Allen, also with OED. Great. Excellent. Welcome to all of you. So, Yolanda, please proceed. I'll just make some quick uh, overview comments. Um, so, as we have um, indicated here, we'll be l learning about um, the mayor's proposed budget for the Office of Economic Development. And as we move through this process, central staff will be supporting council members on identifying and discussing budget issues um, that will be presented in various issue identification memos uh, later in mid-October and also discuss possible changes to proposed budget in um, at that same time. And then later in October, uh, central staff will be preparing council change requests for the committee's consideration. So that's a quick reminder of the process. And um, with that, this will, I will let Office of Economic Development uh, present their strategic priorities with their new director, which was appointed by the council in June. Great, and we have Ben Noble at the table too. Are you kicking this off or we're going right to Mr. Lee? No. Straight to Bobby. Great, all right. And just for Thanks. the record, I actually started in April. Oh, I know, yeah. time but flies, you were appointed though. in June. Oh, that, oh, good technicality. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, council members. And I just want to personally also share my uh, gratitude and 
and thanks to all of you who helped me transition into this position. And especially Councilmember Herbold uh, gave me a lot of great coaching. And so far, I've stayed out of any big trouble so far. And so thank you all for that. It's been a great transition. And uh, safe to say that I, I love Seattle. It's a great place. And so thank you all. Um, when I started this position in April, um, I first conducted an extensive analysis of Seattle's economy. I looked at the past, the present, and I think where we're headed. And the numbers are really um, amazing, it's especially as a professional uh, a profession in the economic development field. In, in less than 10 years, Seattle job market has grown 25%. And that is an amazing number. Uh, it outpaces the national average. But in terms of population growth that comes with the job growth, it has grown 19% in less than 10 years. The medium household income has increased 50% since 2007 to 2017. Amazing numbers. And but despite the incredible economic comeback since the recession, poverty and income disparity has grown. And it's this paradox that my department is here to help solve. And in order to address this growing paradox, economic paradox, we reshaped our mission as a department, and our new mission is to build an inclusive economy. And there are four core strategies that we're using to advance this new mission. One is workforce development. Second is small business technical assistance. Third is industry cluster strategy. And fourth is neighborhood business districts. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, as an intro, and then we'll dive into the presentation unless there's any questions. Right. Thank you for that, Bobby, and I really appreciate how much and how fast you have dived in, and um, I look forward to seeing your presentation. Good deal. Um, in this first slide, we are reviewing significant legislative changes that affected OED's budget in 2019. There are really two main ones that I want to bring your attention to. The first has to do with um, a repayment that OED had to make to HUD related to community development block grant expenditures. In, 20, in 2018, we had a HUD auditor come in and review our 2017 program activities. And with um, particularly looking at our neighborhood business district program, the Only in Seattle program, and their activities. And what HUD determined was that a lot of the activities for which OED and Only in Seattle were responsible felt like they were just not a good fit for community development block grant. Although the program has been going on in this, um, with this type of investment for at least seven years, um, it really was determined that this is not a good funding um, fit for a lot of Only in Seattle neighborhood business district investments. So. Um, we repaid for the findings for 2017. This appropriation made that possible and really have to look at restructuring how we do our engagement with neighborhood business districts. So later in the presentation, you'll, you'll see a bit of a funding swap that was made possible by um, an infusion of general fund into the Only in Seattle program. The second item is a transfer between um, OED's budget and OPCD, Office of Planning and Community Development, where they had $400,000 of community development block grant um, from a prior, I think it was 2018 budget that was unspent, that in working with our staff, they felt like our use of it with our new tenant improvement pilot program was a good investment. And so we're using the, putting that money to, to good use this year and investing it with a project in the central area known as the Liberty Bank Project, where we're providing some funds to help build out a tenant space. And that will be used with um, a small business that is owned, um, it's that brown girl cooks. Some of you may be familiar with that 
with that company, and they're building now a restaurant space. Great. And is all four hundred thousand dollars of that going to the Liberty Bank site? It is. Yes. Yeah. Good deal. Well, I'll take it from here. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, tr the even with the incredible economic performance here at Seattle and truly an amazing numbers uh, as an economic development profession and I just never seen numbers like this before. It's just truly unprecedented and, um, and, and a lot of the credit goes to all of your work. Um, much of the economic performance um, in part is because of the policies that you have developed creating really an exciting urban environment and I think uh, much of the credit goes to the council and your leadership and vision. And it's just been extraordinary economic performance here in Seattle. But as I mentioned, uh, underneath the average macro numbers, if you dig in a little bit deeper, certain segments of our community are not keeping up. And uh, the economy is not as inclusive as it should be. And particularly for people of color and for the immigrant population, uh, this is uh, truly a disturbing uh, trend. In fact, today, I don't know if you had a chance to see uh, the article. I was just going to bring that up. Yeah, yes. and yeah. so it just highlights uh, when you have income disparity where whites are making $105,000 a year, whereas African Americans are being, uh, getting $42,000 a year, the disparity is, I mean, it's just tremendous disparity. Right. And based on my analysis, and I'll be happy to share my report uh, of my analysis of the economy, we believe that this trend will only continue. And so that's why we, we want to be more. The Delta sure. continues. I'm sorry? I said Delta continues. That's correct. The disparity uh, will, will grow. Good. Would you kindly send that to all oh, of, of course. us? Of course. Of course. I'll be, I'll be happy to do that. Mail that to all of you us. You bet. And at a different point, outside of the budget process, I would love to have a work session to just dig in a little bit more, because we do find this as an alarming trend. Um, and on top of that, there's a report that just came out showing that 42.13% of the work will be automated in the near future here in King County. And so not only are we seeing the knowledge economy not being inclusive, but the automation economy, which we call the network economy, will also bring in new technology like AI that will replace some of the jobs, especially in the service sector. So we have reports here that I will also be happy to send out as well. So we see these trends. Um, and what we want to do is, uh, what we're offering here is four different strategies, as I mentioned. Number one is workforce development. And most of the workforce development dollars are really federally funded here in Seattle. And is through what is called the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act. And this is through uh, Department of Labor, and Department of Labor has a formula based on population and poverty, and so it's automatically distributed to different states. Um, but, but, but over time, uh, in the last 15 years, uh, the funding from federal government has eroded, usually about 5% a year. And so we are seeing this investment from the federal level in workforce in, uh, training. Um, and, and so we have to somehow find a way to make it up <laughs> at the local level or through partnership with private sector. And uh, uh, bless you. <laughs> and, and, but workforce investment that is publicly funded is uh, the, the number of total dollars is shrinking. And so that's, a, that's also a sign that, um, that, that we're concerned about. Um, and in here in Seattle, uh, the, workforce, the, the local workforce dollars through general funds matches then with the federal dollars and other dollars. And then in totality, we try to create a unified workforce system by matching these dollars in different ways. So we have a unified system. Um, and majority of the funding also goes to underserved population and for the immigrant population. Uh, and, and when you hear the word workforce development, really you should, there should be one word that comes to your mind, and that is training. It's really ultimately about how many people can train and skill up and, and help people obtain higher quality jobs, family wage jobs for underserved population. The second strategy is around small business technical assistance. Um, in order to build confidence in our local economy, you need constant innovation an injection of new small business in the pipeline. 
That's what drives confidence. And all of us then will spend more money and so forth. So encouraging new startups and new small businesses is a fundamental part of building confidence in our local economy. And so part of our work is to help small businesses and entrepreneurs of color continue to drive innovation in our local economy. Good. Um, Bobby, can I, yeah. go, can I go back to something that you were talking about just a moment ago, and that's workforce development? Um, all of us up here have been very engaged in supporting apprenticeship programs and pre-apprenticeship right. programs, and Councilmember Juarez was doing a superb job with the North Seattle College this year. I'm, I'm interested in knowing whether you have connected with uh, Dave Gehring with our manufacturing and industrial uh, group on something that he called Core Plus. He's been working with, uh, I believe it's Rainier Beach High School primarily, but also with connecting with Boeing so that, that we've got this training you're talking about. Right. Uh, and I know the port is interested in creating a maritime high school comparable to what I think it's Highline School District is doing with the aviation high school. So I'm just, is that something that your office is connecting with or is that through deal or both? Mm -hmm. Well, our office, I did meet with the port uh, to look at co-funding um, the program. And one thing that um, I feel strongly about in the manufacturing field uh, in general is that the, it, generally the data shows that people of color, the, the, the manufacturing sector tends to be much more inclusive. Uh, the barrier to entry is lower. And so a, when you, try to promote this vision around inclusive economy, manufacturing sector is a great sector. And so we have earmarked some dollars already to invest in the manufacturing academy with the port. I don't recall the exact amount from top of my head, and I'll, I can research that and follow up but on that. I, I'm, I'm just heartened to know that you're talking with them. Absolutely. Because one of the things that we know that the system improves when all of these organizations that have a piece of it are working together. Absolutely. So if you're talking with the port and if you've reached out to the MIC, um, I think that that's going to be a real advantage for everyone because then we can leverage those dollars and combine people's not only good intentions but the smart work they're already doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Council Member Wars, yes. and then Council Member Mosqueda. Just a quick question that we've been looking at. Thank you, Council, or thank you, Chairwoman, um, for the apprenticeship building trades program that we've just started and completely got filled up in North Seattle that we want to continue and we'll work with the state legislature on making it more permanent. We filled every cohort for the next year. And a lot of those folks are coming from Ingram High School through the Promise Program. But you said something that has piqued me and that has piqued my attention because we've been working with labor and discussing it. And I'm glad you said it because you said it much more eloquently than me. Is that, and I want to ask you the question, and I may know the answer, but I want to hear from you. Um, why is the manufacturing s sector more inclusive? I, I kind of I understand, but I just want to hear from your perspective briefly. Well, in Seattle, um, if you look at the manufacturing sector, which is actually very small if you look at the national average, and some people will argue that it's because Boeing is outside the city limits. But from our analysis, even if you include Boeing and look at the regional average, still compared to the national average, manufacturing industry is relatively small. We're a knowledge-based economy here in Seattle. But the, to answer your question, and by the way, in the last five years, the manufacturing industry has shrunk 4%. So the trend is going downwards. Um, in general, the way I would answer it is that is the barrier to entry is just lower. Uh, you can skill up on the job easier. And if you look at the, the manufacturing sector in Seattle, actually about half or maybe a little bit less than a half is transportation manufacturing. And the second largest is food process manufacturing. And then the numbers get smaller than the rest of them. The concern I have with the manufacturing sector is that the, it's, it's actually, it's, there's a great imbalance in gender representation. But in terms of number of people of color is higher than other sectors. Yeah. You bet. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Mosqueda, then Councilmember Herbold. 
Thank you very much. Um, Director Lee, it was great to hear you also yesterday on KUOW talking about this vision for the city. Um, really appreciate the work that you've brought also from Portland and thank you for connecting us with some of the folks in Portland, for example, at the Portland Mercado who are doing exactly what you led down there and what you've spoken to today, which is how do we help uh, specifically immigrant and community of color uh, individuals get into business and be successful. So very excited about your leadership and you can see why uh, we are so excited about the direction that OED is headed. Um, I guess my big question is, uh, given the priorities that you just outlined and the way in which I look at the budget, the changes from the endorsed to the proposed this year, I see a 0.5% or a 0.5 FTE change. I see a change of an additional million, but there's so many important issues that you have to tackle. And I think we have a more restrictive um, constitution here in Washington state that makes your job even more challenging. Uh, would you comment on the partnership that you have with Office of Labor Standards, given this emphasis on workforce development, um, is there any additional opportunities that you see between OLS and your department to do exactly what you talked about in terms of workforce development on, I would say, um, low carbon jobs? Uh, Naima Klein the other day talked about how uh, domestic workers and uh, janitors and service providers and long-term care providers, these folks are in the low carbon emission industry. I mean, it's very, very um, uh, important work that they do, and also it doesn't contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, for example. If we can use more of our public dollars to support more of these service sector jobs and to get them at a higher wage, that seems to both be fulfilling your desire to make sure that more people have stable jobs and potentially a pathway out of um, generational poverty, they can get more economically stable and then maybe start their own business, for example, with some of our domestic workers. Mm -hmm. um, with that sort of framework, is that the correct analysis that we're only looking at a million dollar increase in your budget? Does that sound right? Um, I think at the end of the presentation, we'll get at, at the increment. And I think that actually the increment is only around I want to say 500,000 off the top of okay. my head. Um, I'm just going to flag for the chair and our colleagues. I think that there is a really important opportunity for us to leverage partnership here with OED and other departments, and especially as we look at starting small businesses and getting folks out of this generational poverty cycle, um, as we create healthy and thriving local economies for low-wage workers, for communities of color and immigrant workers um, to start their own business. I see this as an economic stimulus, so I might be interested in working with uh, the chair as we think about how we enhance some of these partnerships that have just been outlined. Good. Thanks for the early alert. It, go ahead. It's always nice to know coming in that the council's supporting your work. Yeah, I said, wow, I'm just having a great time here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I, do you mind if I just add one more aspect? Oh, please, go ahead. We're in good shape. One of the challenge that we'll be facing is also recession. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And not only automation and the changing of our economy because of AI and the network economy and the modernization of the telecommunication system, but recession coupled with automation is a big concern that I have. And we don't have time to get into that today. But in other cities, in Portland, for example, we set aside, I think, around 3.5 million for recession planning because many people that get displaced, which will be predominantly people of color and immigrant population, mm -hmm. is to help them start businesses during the recession or help them with dislocated worker programs to get retrained when the economy is bad. And at a different point, not today, we do need to think proactively about the recession. And so we'll, we'll talk more about that down the road, coupled with the strategies that you pointed out. No, that, that is absolutely right. And um, a couple of other departments have spoken to me about oh. how do we combine those efforts. Right. Because um, as our buddy Ben Noble, Dr. Doom over here, tells us that we know that the recession is coming eventually. Um, so to the extent that we can get out in front of that, both with job training um, housing, all the work that we've been talking about and rec recognizing the impact of gentrification on many of the people who have lived here. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us going forward, putting you in charge of the lead of this, of course. Yeah. That's just a recommendation. Um, it's the mayor's decision regarding departments. Sure. But I think you're right on, and uh, obviously you've got support up here for that. Okay. Thank you. I'll just continue the slides here. Oh. 
Oh, oh sorry. Council Member Herbold oh, had a I'm question. Sorry. Yeah. I just, um, on, along the uh, train of thought um, that we are pursuing here as it relates to changing circumstances, um, whether or not that's a recession or automation, I think uh, another set of changing circumstances um, that we are not just anticipating, but we're working on trying to lead um, is um, moving away from um, trying to create the markets and the policies that will result in us moving away from re reliance on fossil fuels. Um, and that will, um, that will um, change the face of employment for many people um, in the um, energy sector. And um, so one of the things that we have talked about committing to um, as part of um, moving several policy objectives that we've identified in Seattle's Green New Deal is a commitment to a just transition uh, for the workforce um, of those industries that we're trying to move away from. And um, I see that we need to have some department in the city at the lead uh, for developing um, a just transition strategy and then the programs uh, to put to be put in place um, to implement that strategy because essentially we're talking about um, retraining uh, uh, programs for for workers who are currently in these jobs that we're trying to move away from um, what do you see as as your role um, in 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 that endeavor and um, is that something that we should consider um, a strategic priority for 2020? You bet. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Today at 3 o'clock, I'm flying to San Francisco uh, with the mayor to actually uh, learn about the EV bus manufacturing sector. Um, because as you know better than I do, the metro, uh, they're doing RFP process to replace many of their vehicles to be electric, uh, battery-driven uh, uh, buses. And what we want to do is continue to grow what we call um, the, it's a, uh, it's a cluster strategy for the clean energy industry. And so we actually have a staff that leads that effort. And it is majority of the businesses in Seattle in that sector tends to be small. And so what we did, which we'd love to show you because we have a visual of this and this dynamic visual, we actually can explain all the connected different technology connections between those companies in that sector. And, but what we need to do is um, continue to grow that sector, but <coughs> also be cautious that there's a chance that some of those technologies will be automated. Mm -hmm. And so research and development that's coupled with manufacturing, that having that whole vertical is what I think will provide the middle wage jobs in Seattle. But we'll be happy to lead on that effort. We have a lot of good work that we've already done, so we'll be happy to share that. That's and we're right. excited about it. Good. Thank you so much. I know we've been working with OSE as well. And the two of you, the work that Jessica Finn Coven is doing, mm -hmm. uh, would be a wonderful matchup. So thank you for, again, that system work. Thank you. Good. So I think that's all the questions here, so please proceed. Okay. <laughs> How much time do I? We're okay? Yeah, okay. yeah we, we want, it. We so want the third to hear part, from you. The third part of the four uh, strategies that I talked about to advance inclusive economy agenda is really around how do we get industries, and we just actually talked about this, is the industry cluster strategy. And some may ask, well, why is it that you're focused on medium-sized and larger businesses? And the way I would answer that is that in order to create an inclusive economy, government can't do it alone. <laughs> we have to get medium-sized and larger businesses to use their procurement power and hiring capacity to hire from underserved population and also to procure their investments to local small businesses owned by people of color. So really, it's an alignment of their investments that is a big part of that function. The last part is neighborhood business district strategy. And I find this one to be uh, extremely exciting. Um, in order, when you have vibrant commercial corridors in neighborhoods, that's what builds resiliency in those neighborhoods. 
And what studies have shown is that when you have a vibrant commercial corridors, crime goes down, people take pride in their own neighborhood, they get more engaged in civic activities, they vote more. And so it's not just an economic gardening strategy, if you will, but it is truly a community development and community building uh, platform for neighborhoods. And so that is one dimension that we have as our part of our four uh, uh, core services at OED. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, we are part of the Small Business Advisory Committee, and I think they probably couldn't agree more with you about the need to invest in yeah. um, those small business corridors, uh, especially as we move forward with our efforts to upzone the um, <coughs> urban uh, villages across the city. It's really important that we do that with housing and childcare and health services and small businesses, which you saw as a priority of ours in last year's um, MHA or earlier this year's MHA discussion. Um, how have the uh, OED priorities around these urban corridors been informed by the Small Business Advisory Committee? And do you see that as a representative body? Is it diverse enough in line with your vision of the folks that we really want to help support during a potential downturn coming up? That's a really good question. I, I think I need a little bit more time to um, work with the Advisory Committee, but they've been truly committed and um, the energy level extremely high and overall they bring pretty diverse perspectives and many of their issues are right on and um, uh, for example uh, permitting process uh, regulatory compliance issues um, also how do we earmark portions of our urban environment for local businesses and in other cities by law uh, you only are allowed the local businesses. So, so in fact, the neighborhood that I lived in Portland, by law, it has to be local, locally owned businesses in that neighborhood. So they wanted us to explore those type of tools. Um, so I think many of the issues that they're talking about is, is consistent with some of the ideas that I bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but I think it's still in the early stage. We, we still need to grow that committee and make them feel more comfortable about city policies and so forth. It takes time to learn how the city works. So we're still in the growing phase, I think. Yeah. Please go ahead. follow up. Thank you. Um, so you spoke exactly to the issue that's a big priority for oh, me, and that's okay. permitting. Right. Um, and I right. think that there's a lot of common ground in our desire to see these businesses get up and um, start up and be successful, and the concerns that we're hearing from uh, nonprofit developers, from communities of color, organizations who want to support small businesses. Is there specific money earmarked in your budget to expedite or enhance the permitting process so that it's much more streamlined in the future? Right. That's a really good question. In other cities, my department would actually fund some FTEs in the permitting department so that when we refer clients, small business owners from, from uh, immigrant population or owners who are people of color and they're having challenges, then we have a case manager within the permitting department that would help case manage, if you will, the permitting process. But what I've also found was that um, majority of the issues around permitting is actually the application process where the applicant just didn't understand the application process and it's just going back and forth trying to get complete information. That's what stalls majority of the application process. So in my opinion, although um, we would have to do a little bit of a study on this, is that what we need is capacity to educate the applicants before they submit their applications. I think that will actually help accelerate it. The other issue that you will hear from permitting departments, not just here in Seattle, but in throughout many cities, is that how do you justify one group being accelerated versus another person not? And so within the system, uh, it does create a paradox within their permitting process that we also need to help define what we mean by acceleration uh, so that there's clear direction for permit, permitting uh, departments to understand what that actually means. For example, larger businesses can actually afford to purchase navigators, third-party consultants who understands the process. And this was brought up by SBAC, actually. 
but even SBEC members who can afford to do that said, what about the small businesses that can't afford that? Mm -hmm. So they feel conflicted by it as well. So there are some issues to be worked out there, but I think if we can start um, with a pilot, have some capacity to do some research and really dig into this, but also have capacity for proactive education, I think that would be a good start going into this. Great, thank you. You know, our own Calvin Goings yeah. um, of FAS fame used to be the director of the Small Business Administration for Region 10. And it's always been a mystery to me about what and how SBA works with our departments. Do you have any, can you shed any light on that or can we use them as a resource? Yeah, SBA is a federally designated program. Um, they do have access to capital programs, um, that, which means uh, loans and revolving loans and small grants. But admittedly, um, if you look at the national trends, number of applicants for those loans has declined because the process is so stringent. Mm -hmm. And what we'll hear from small businesses is that if the process, and we talked about this through CDPG money actually, the amount of paperwork actually is a hinder mm -hmm. to serving underserved population. But on the other hand, we're using public dollars and we have to be transparent and hold ourselves accountable. But somewhere in there, we have to find the right balance. But SBA does provide uh, access to capital and technical assistance programs. Thanks. Any other questions? Councilmember Herbold. Um, the line of um, questioning that uh, Councilmember Mosqueda was um, pursuing uh, reminded me of the uh, mayor's executive order uh, from earlier this year. Um, I, was, I thought I recalled that that executive order um, created a navigator for this purpose. I don't as well as the, the small business um, citywide yeah. uh, advisory group, or not the, the mm -hmm. uh, there's like an interdepartmental team as well to help right. um, uh, with issues that are sort of uh, cross-departmental. That's right. Uh, I think it's called CBAC. I think that's the acronym. That's right. The uh, executive order that was signed on November 30th, I believe. Oh, okay. Last year. That sounds year. about right. Okay. Of last yeah. year. Uh, um, was for interdepartmental uh, solutions committee, if you will, looking at cutting red tape and streamlining processes for small businesses. Mm -hmm. I have a report that's coming in next Tuesday from my team around that. I know there's been some struggle collecting good information from different departments around this, uh, but I'll be happy to uh, share with you my report uh, once I get it on Tuesday. Okay. But I think. Generally, though, I think it's a great approach. It, ultimately, it is a multi-departmental, multi it has to be a multi-departmental de strategy to cut red tapes. And uh, so I'll be happy to share that report on Tuesday. Right. And, and one other question, if I may. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about um, how important it is to, for this office to have um, a, a laser focus on stabilization, especially for small businesses owned by people of color and historically underrepresented groups. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit um, how uh, the legacy business program that I've been working on with your department fits into your 2020 strategic priorities as it relates to that shared objective. Uh, uh, coincidentally, yesterday I met with uh, uh, this, the president of the city council of San Francisco last night and we had dinner together and we actually ended up Very robust about, legacy business yeah, program yeah. there. Which is interesting because they also had um, concerns about the program, but in general, San Francisco, um, um, their, their program is pretty advanced, and I know that my staff, before I got here, used San Francisco model as a, as a benchmark to develop uh, some of the proposals that is being proposed here in Seattle. And it was an interesting exchange that I had with, with the counselor from San Francisco. Um, but over and all, I believe that legacy business is fundamental part of economic development and that is, is consistent with a uh, small business technical assistance program that we have. Um, studies have shown if you look at hospitality industry, for example, most visitors now are wanting to visit legacy businesses as an example. Mm -hmm. If you go to the website on hospitality uh, industry like Visit Seattle and, and other cities, they're not advertising these uh, four-star hotels. They're advertising neighborhood businesses. That's what the, the trend towards 
visitors is, is to visit these legacy businesses. Mm -hmm. And so it is a fundamental part of economic development, and I believe that nurturing and supporting legacy businesses is, a, is, is, is something that we have to do to preserve the magic of Seattle. And so I'll just leave it at that for now. Okay, please go ahead. And uh, we've got a few more slides. If oh, we can. yeah, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the third slide is related to the four-year budget summary for OED. And on this slide, you'll notice that there's an increment um, from an OED's budget of a 5% in increase. Um, the most significant changes that are incorporated in that have to do actually with um, pretty mundane, the annual wage increase for staff of 3.6% and some um, increase in citywide overhead allocation related to increased in rates in our HR, human resources overhead rate and Seattle IT overhead <laughs> rate. As well, there were included about $80,000 in um, additional budget related to support uh, the reclassification of staff that were staff-initiated reclassifications. Included in OED's budget, there is a proposal to reallocate existing resources to increase our capacity around um, just our general administrative work and particularly our finance staff, we're um, requesting an increase of um, one of our half-time accounting staff to go up to full-time. And that's um, a direct result into just the fact that OED hasn't seen an increase in um, our overhead staff for many years, actually, and have seen a pretty dramatic increase in our workload as it relates to the number of contracts that we're processing um, and also the city's new financial system, um, so the 9.2 financial system, is unfortunately creating more workload for accounting staff. So we're just, that, that group is just being taxed, so. I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I didn't quite understand what you were saying. What is, what is causing the increased workload? Uh, just the, the new accounting system? That's right. Of course, that was supposed it's to go not, the other not, way. Just to be clear, it wasn't just the new account system. It's also that OED's overall portfolio of work has increased over the past few years, and we have not kept pace in terms of the overall support staff. So right. it's a combination of those two things. I'm not denying the first, but I think it's important to recognize the second as well. Okay, thank yeah. you. Exactly. But I noticed that you're only asking for uh, 0.5, you're on, on the bottom column, a 0.5 FTE That's right. increase. That's right, yep. So with that 0.5 address the concerns that you have? No. Nope. So, <laughs> so um, but this is, this is, this is, we can, we can, um, all right, so Madam we'll, Chair, we'll talk I, a little I bit more offline. I think that that's highly inappropriate, Director Noble. I, I think we are here to ask questions about the appropriateness of the funding, and that. given the level just, of I, investments just, that we, we know we, we need to see. I, I, was, this was a very serious question that I asked earlier, though, oh, no, because a 0.5 FTE, to me, does not signal that there's sufficient resources for the very important work that we just highlighted. So I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah, you were joking. It's fine. I get it that you were joking. No, no, I, actually, so it's a very serious question. No, no, no. I wanted to make, it's actually, actually an opportunity to make a, the broader point that we agree with you, right? That if we had the resources to expand the functions of OED, we would. Um, the discussion I provided you yesterday was the fact that we, we are really up against the wall on these resources. And in fact, sustainability beyond into 2021 is a real challenge. So that's, that, that was why I was making it as a joke in that context. But again, I, I, that is a serious, it is a constraint. I mean, there is more work. That, that I'm not sure you, the mayor, would like to be investing more work, uh, excuse me, more resources in the work of OED, um, and uh, the issues that Bobby's identified are very, very serious ones. So I, as that was, I want to make that, make that clear, and my apologies for taking that too lighthearted. Councilmember Mosqueda, did you want to follow up with that? Um, sure, and I appreciate the clarification. Uh, and I also appreciate your work. I'm not trying to create an uh, awkward dynamic here, but this is really the heart of what we're at. Uh, with 0.5 FTE, what I just heard was that this work is really to help address some of the concerns that are coming up because of this accounting system, which I need to learn more about because it does sound like this is um, a problem that has been potentially unaddressed and is causing a workload crunch at OED. I'm also asking um, 
with all the work that we have to do, it does sound like you've been asked to do more with less over the last few years. And um, can you help me understand, because when I looked at the in initial budget numbers, I thought we were looking at a um, $10.2 million budget moving to an $11.2 million budget. Am I looking at numbers from a proposed uh, budget versus the adopted budget for 2020, or is there just only about a, fi a 0 0.5, as you say, $543,000 increase here? What is the increase in the overall budget? The increase to the overall budget is the 543000 Okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. Well, we will and follow up. And I guess up. also, Council Member Muscatted, that um, you'll also notice, so this slide only shows you the increments. Mm -hmm. So it'll only show you where there's some kind of an overall increase, but it does also include it in OED's budget is um, the addition of a, a new FTE that is in support of um, our creative industry work that we're doing, a strategic advisor position to help policy development around that creative cluster. So that won't show up because there was um, also a reduction in a uh, position. So the net of that would be zero. You don't see that Got it. That change. I also, there was one significant issue that we, I don't think we've talked enough about, and that is um, the, the, some of the small business support work that had been funded by the department previously had been relied upon community development block grant dollars. Um, and we got, a, if you will, an unfavorable ruling from the federal government about the use of those dollars and that we had, uh, if you will, misinterpreted the eligibility of that program. So we are faced with a difficult question um, about whether to restructure the program to fall into compliance, um, which would have really restricted our ability to provide important assistance, or to find, if you will, a different color of money. So there is a $300,000 increment of general fund to the budget um, that is designed to preserve that program and, uh, and actually in the end to grow it, because what we've done is to keep the community development block grant dollars that we're going to be in the program. We're going to, uh, Bobby and his team are going to Re, uh, direct those in a way that will maintain their eligibility with the federal requirements. But given that those are going to impose constraints, we added $300,000 of general fund to be sure that the original intent of the program could be maintained. So the net effect is an increase in overall funding um, and a preservation of the, flexibility, of the flexible dollars that are really essential to make the program work. So that was a, a key component of the decision making here in addition to the, the increment in staff to support um, the, the overall functions of the department. Thank, thank you for that. Can you tell me where I see that three hundred thousand dollars, either on this chart or page. elsewhere? It's this next page. I'm I'm there. There it is. Oh, I've got it. And An OIS the, the funding. OIS funding restructuring. Thank you. Yeah. So this OIS being only in Seattle. Only in Seattle. Yeah. So this last slide calls out some of these incremental changes from our um, 2019 budget, um, where we're reorganizing um, staff and within the creative cluster uh, work we're looking at um, a change there related to this new staff member. Um, part of OED's budget has been the Office of Film and Music. Part of the Office of Film and Music's work has been in support of the Seattle Music Commission. The budget, the mayor's proposed budget includes a proposal to move that work over into the Office of Arts and Culture. The Office of Arts and Culture has been funding through admissions tax that work within OED. And the thinking is that there'd be better alignment to keep that work within arts, keep it with its funding source, and to be able to leverage collaboration with the arts staff, while at the same time um, continuing to engage with OED. Um, however, that shift shows a decrement to OED's overall budget. And then as Ben mentioned, we have the only in Seattle neighborhood business district funding restructuring where we're, you'll see a reduction in um, CDBG funding that's going to the only in Seattle program and an infusion in general fund as a way to offset that. Um, and I guess uh, the decrement of 480,000 is not exactly a full decrease to the Only in Seattle program. That our, what, we're, what we're planning to do is to take that $480,000 and reinvest it in our small business team program work, working on business stabilization and tenant improvement opportunities for small businesses. 
the only in Seattle program applicants will have access into that money and will earmark 180,000 of those funds specifically for the only in Seattle program applicants use. And in that way, the only in Seattle program will remain whole and, and at the same time have this additional flexibility of a better alignment of the funding sources. Can I just Thank make you, a minor uh, just clarification? Mm -hmm. Whether Music Commission is within arts or OED is still up in the air. We, what we want to do is give mu the Music Commission an opportunity to make that decision ultimately. And so we're just, we're having to deliberate with them on that issue. Great, because it, 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 cer it certainly really makes sense. I mean, either department, it can, can thrive. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, Ben, go ahead. I just want to further clarify, I mean, although they're negatives shown here, so parentheticals, none of them represent an actual loss of resource. Um, the music issue, the music commission issues would be a transfer to another department, so the, the underlying resources are there, and the 480,000 of community development block grant is shifting from one, one program to another within OED, so there, there's a net addition of resource. I just I think that's clear, but I wanted to make sure it was. Oh, thank you. Chair? Yes, it is clear now. Thanks, Council Member Her Herbold. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, give my colleagues um, the benefit of the discussions that um, I and uh, Director Lee have had about the, um, the proposed reorg here. Just to be very clear and transparent, um, what this proposes is um, uh, a reorg that um, will embrace a creative economy cluster strategy, but it will mean um, the uh, removal of the Office of Film and Music from OED. Um, and so um, if you, you could talk a little bit about that process um, around the um, developing the creative industry cluster program yeah. and um, the decision that um, you have come to to no longer have an office of film and music as part of that process. Yeah, I'll just make, thank you for the question. Um, I think there's been a little bit of confusion on that. So by city ordinance, there is, the Office of Economic Development was created through ordinance, mm -hmm. okay? <coughs> but there is no ordinance for Office of Film and Music. Yes, I've researched that That's a function. <laughs> and so it's not a separate department. And OFM has always been part of OED's portfolio, and the legal authority for permitting and budgeting falls under OED. Right. OFM name might change because the term OFM is outdated. It doesn't recognize special events and other functions. So the staff feels that the brand is outdated. That's something we'll revisit, revisit down the road. Mm -hmm. But the staff there will continue the work of permitting that exists currently. We're simply adding more capacity to pivot our economic development strategy towards creative economy to address the future automation issue that we briefly talked about earlier. Our studies have shown that AI cannot replace creative minds. And so that industry, if we can scale as many Seattleites to get into the industry, then we believe there's a better chance for Seattleites to navigate the new economy, especially if we can position underserved population from service sector and propel them into the network economy. We have to have some strategy in place for that. And so that's, and we'll talk more about automation and AI and so forth a, a little bit down the road. So that's why creative industry cluster has been proposed. But the office, uh, you will not see, um, you know, OFM will still exist. And the branding issue on the long term will have to be addressed with the stakeholders. I just spoke with the film industry late last night and several other occasions as well. So they, they're aware that the branding is a little outdated. But the staff will still be there providing permitting, special events permitting, all those functions will still be in place. Just, just for clarification. But the clarification is, um, I think, still muddy, but that's because I, I understand this is, these are ongoing conversations. Um, there is no um, legislatively defined Office of Film and Music, but there has been a division of um, OED that we've all referred to as the Office of Film and Music. There's, right. They've had their own director. Um, that um, that 
organization of staff will no longer, as I understand it, uh, be referred to as the Office of Film and Music. And I think, and, and I think that's important for folks to understand because um, even if, if its creation uh, was perhaps clunky and, and not recognized uh, by ordinance, and um, it, perhaps it's been awkward to have um, an Office of Economic Development with another director, um, another division with an, its own director within it, um, the, the, the creation of the Office of Film and Music was was done for a reason. It was done because of a desire to f uh, focus on the economic activities, uh, particularly around uh, the, the regulatory needs of the film and music industry. Um, and that focus on film and music is now going to be in a broader uh, grouping that we're referring to as um, the uh, uh, creative uh, industry cluster. So I just, um, and, and, and it may be a different name, but I think I just want to be really transparent with, with my colleagues on the council that this is a, this is a change, um, and I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit yeah. about how um, you worked with the community and you worked with um, the arts office to to come to this point that we're at right now. Thank you so much. The um, as I initially uh, talked about my the research that we've done in terms of economic trends. Um, we looked into how the, the knowledge-based economy is going to evolve into the future, especially with 5G technology serving as the backbone uh, to the next economy called the network economy. And 5G is just around the corner, and the modernization of telecommunication system will change the way we do work. Um, and smart cities, um, autonomous vehicle, you know, these type of new instruments will be the mainstream instrument moving forward in the next economy. And the, the Governor Locke actually did a speech just a couple of days ago that 15% of Seattle's jobs are predicted to go away in the next 10 years because of AI. So based on that, we d decided to do a study on which industries will be able to survive in the next work economy and not be replaced with robotics. And so the creative industry is what a place that we determine as a good place to be. The Office of Film and Music's mission is to scale the creative industry. So actually, it's, it's been adopted. It was adopted three years ago. So it's not a change to the mission at all. In fact, it is an alignment of the mission that currently exists. The term OFM, we believe we should continue to remain that term because it's causing confusion. Mm -hmm. But their work will not only include permitting and technical assistance, but now their work will include economic development, advancement in the creative industry. And so I'm, I'm sorry that it's causing confusion to some degree. I did meet with the labor union groups as well as the film stake. We had three events. We uh, invited all the stakeholders um, the industry has been uh, suffering because the film industry has evolved. The independent film production sector has really declined because everyone wants to do the Avengers or these big ones, and Netflix also has a big role in the decline of that industry. On the other hand, they, we have local procurement like Visit Seattle that we just met yesterday. They're used, we asked them for future investments on your video production for your websites. Please, let's work together to invest in our local companies for that work. So what we, start, what we need to do is provide more contract opportunities for that industry, mm -hmm. and our staff through the cluster initiative will advance that work. <laughs> Is, made, is, is encouraging larger business and medium-sized established businesses to invest in local companies in that industry to help them grow and to hire people in the creative economy to get ready for the network economy. And so that's part of the cluster strategy. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I will also say I'm confused because OFM is also Office of Financial Management in oh, Olympia. Okay. So, um, and that's, you know, and that's the, I think, the acronym with which we are usually <coughs> favored when we talk about OFM. So as you're going forward renaming, you might think about that. Uh, also, just one last thing for me. Uh, you know, we've worked with the film and music industry across Seattle 
uh, trying to encourage Olympia to realize the value of film and investing in that. We are way below Vancouver, BC in terms of state investments, significantly below California and... And Oregon. Yeah. Yes, and Oregon. We are an orphan here. Um, and I would just like to, as you're going through this work, just to be able to, to get the facts and figures behind why it's important and why the value comes back to the state. I understand Spokane's killing us right now with its film in industry uh, and so many films going there and, and using the facilities they've already developed. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else that you would like to raise? We're at, at 1030 mark right now. Oh, I think we're good. All right. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you for your leadership on this, Councilmember Herbold. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, last question, please. Oh, it's not a question. Uh, well, yeah, it is a question. Just very specific on the film issue. Are, is the city uh, working in conjunction with King County and um, the executive's recent announcement that he would like to do what the state has not been able to do and um, encourage good living wage jobs in the film industry? I know he just made a recent announcement. I'm not familiar with the details, but are we working in collaboration with the executive in King County? Right. The, um, their announcement and our announcement came at the same time. Oh, okay. And uh, we are excited. Okay. Because this is, economic development is really a regional, uh, it's, it's just more, much more than one city uh, strategy. At the same time, the state is also pr um, promoting new initiative around this. And uh, so we're really excited about the alignment and the timing. And uh, we met with the director of the film department yesterday, last night, to talk about alignment. And uh, so we're really excited about it. And we'll be happy to come back at some point to give you a little bit more details Super. on our investment strategies. Right. Well, I, I want to encourage you and thank you for that work, because uh, the regional approach in all of these things is what's going to move us forward. That's right. So thank you for that. OK, well, um, Bobby, Amanda, thank you for being at the table. And we will move on to our next item and invite our friends from Parks and Recreation. Jesus, I see you out there. Tracy? Thanks. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So as you all get settled in, uh, Tracy, let's see, um, Council Member Juarez, do you want to introduce this for us? I do, and I'll be very brief because I know that um, um, Superintendent Aguirre has a lot to add. Um, I just want to, and you know, and we've had talks offline um, with, um, now I understand it's Dr. Noble um, and the superintendent and Tracy. So I will let um, Jesus does what he does well, but I do want to make this commentary, which will, um, I don't want to have to repeat it all through the budget process, but this is my main concern about sharing parks. Um, first of all, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed working with you. Tracy's been phenomenal. We've done a lot of great things, but I'm going to continue to push on community centers because community centers like libraries and food banks have evolved and adapted to the most emergent needs in our society. What we have in community centers, libraries, food banks are basically enhanced service centers. They're doing more than just providing a place to go swim, checking out a book, or getting food. We know that they're providing um, social services for you know, housing, for medical, um, um, eviction prevention, social services, our NAV teams. So I'm going to continue to push that community centers be that community space and have the resources, not just to have the um, programming to address issues for our elders and our children, our disabled community, um, but also have the capital to start looking at an expansion of where we need community centers where we have none. Now, Mr. Noble and I had an interesting exchange. I was more hot than he was, but because um, I called BS, but that's another issue. Um, I don't like it when I get the, well, if we do this for you, we have to do it for everyone. Um, that's what you say to a sixth grader, not to an elected official. When the community in the city is saying, Thank you for the programming. Thank you for some expansion. But there is brick and mortar needed throughout the city and more than just maintenance. So I will leave it at that because we've had long conversations and uh, we'll have some more down the road. But I just wanted to add it, it has been a real pleasure working with you, Superintendent. Great. Thank you, and, and I've enjoyed my initial tenure, and I'm really enjoying the second time around here. Good. Thank and you for your support. Um, uh, can we you start all. with introductions at the table, sure. and then I'm going to let Tracy do a quick intro. So, Tracy, do you want to start? Surely, Tracy Rest of Council Central Staff. And Jesus. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Tom, um, Ben. Oh, Hello, go ahead. Jesus Aguirre, Seattle Parks and Recreation. I'm Donnie Grabowski, Parks and Recreation Finance. Nice to see you. Very good. Okay, Tracy, please. Council members, uh, you have in front of you, obviously, the Parks and uh, Department, who's going to go over the changes from uh, the endorsed budget to the proposed 2020. Uh, in my three and a half days of review of their budget, um, I have found mostly that they have uh, complied with the changes in particular that the council made to the budget last year. Um, there were a number of changes. Uh, there is one slight um, change that they are going to discuss today having to do with funding that was allocated for waiting pools, but I will let them go ahead and uh, talk with you as they go through their presentation. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Jesus, Yeah. You're thank on. you. And, and thank you for the opportunity. And so uh, we'll walk through the slides, but as, as we jump in, um, just want to, uh, again, uh, appreciate all of you for your support, particularly the, the folks on the on the parks uh, committee, um, but, but and also the, the residents. It's been really exciting to hear feedback directly. And, and Council Member, you know, uh, what is your point about the community centers and the need to, to really understand the needs of our communities is really important to me. Um, and as we jump into the, the first slide, this really talks about our overall policy framework. And, and, and you know, all of this for us is anchored in sort of the broader mission of, uh, you know, we work on supporting the, you know, uh, our, our residents, helping them be healthy. We, we, we really focus on helping the environment stay healthy and then building strong communities. So all of the work we do there, drives our, that drives our mission and our values. And all of that is anchored in, in access and inclusiveness and, and, of course, in equity. And so the, the two major um, uh, legislative pieces here for 2019 that are going to impact our work uh, are, are really hitting at those values. And, and the first one is, is truly about just fundamental basic access. I think as council might know, back in 2011, uh, the Department of Justice did an audit, uh, sort of a sampling of many of our facilities in parks and recreation and found over 4,000 uh, citations uh, in terms of our inability to comply with the ADA uh, um, Act. And so, you know, the, the, the department and the city obviously have been focusing on that and FAS as a new mandate here. Uh, and for us, in addition to the to the work uh, that was highlighted during the DOH, DOJ audit, we sort of did our own third party assessment and uh, as we can imagine, found even more uh, uh, barriers, more citations, uh, over 7,700. And so we've been working diligently on getting those uh, rectified and will continue to do so. Uh, and so our response to the, to the FAS mandate will be to continue to, to focus on, in a very strategic way, looking at how we can move those barriers. Um, and our budget for 2019-2020 actually includes uh, $3.7 million to continue to, to address those. Great. Jesus, um, if I can just yep. uh, quickly interrupt here. Uh, again, we're talking about a system where I think we can work with our human services department as well around all ages and abilities. Absolutely. And uh, I know it's something that, uh, it's a horse that I've been riding for a long time, but <laughs> making sure that things like park benches are built in such a way that individuals who have difficulties getting up, for example, have what they need in order <laughs> to... <laughs> to um, you know, to have the armrests, and I know it's been an issue. I'm working with Eston on that too to begin to have uh, walking benches. So if you'll continue just to work closely yep. with our human services department on this, I think our funding can be leveraged. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you and for certainly that. working with all of our partners, and, and you mentioned transportation, and I think a lot of the access, we have over 460 parks, and really looking at how we create true access to these parks is going to take a real collaborative approach because there's a lot, of, a lot of investment that needs to be made, but yeah. Um, and then I, I guess moving on to the second one here with regards to the, the Green New Deal and the council's resolution there, uh, and also... Um, in response to the to the mayor's uh, mandate to, to the agencies in 2018 to sort of double down on, on implementing the city's climate action plan, uh, we focused on a couple of different areas, uh, both with our buildings and our facilities, our own operations, uh, with our buildings looking to both to try to reduce the emissions of those buildings and try to move some of our buildings away from uh, sort of the natural gas boilers to some of the electric heat pumps. Uh, but, but those are going to be some long-term discussions that we have, um, as well as... Um, Looking at helping our community to respond, I think the council, as council knows, I think last year we've piloted a couple of um, uh, initiatives in, in four of our facilities to try to deal with increased air filtration for those buildings so that we could help our residents uh, have respite from some of the some of the heat emergencies, smoke emergencies. And luckily, we didn't have this summer, but we did the prior summer. Uh, so as we're doing that, we're learning quite a bit. Uh, I think our challenge, though, is that many of our facilities don't even have HVAC systems here, so we have to think about 
how we're going to address that. Uh, and then even on the operational side, we had lots of internal work and discussions on what do we do uh, in, in case of those heat emergencies or smoke emergencies uh, in our buildings that don't have HVAC systems. How do we, how do we tailor our programmatic operations? And so what, how do we talk to families? How do we, how do we deal with, with young people and, and, and older folks in our buildings and making sure that we keep them safe? So we've been doing a lot of work there and thinking about how to do that. Uh, but but long term, as we do, uh, you know, maintenance and improvement to our buildings, that'll be part of what we continue to work on. And I'll talk more about this as we get into the the, the strategy piece. But uh, a significant part of our planning for we're in the middle of a strategic plan, and, and of course we're going to be um, next year coming back with a proposal for the second six-year cycle of the park district. Uh, a big aspect of that is going to be sort of how how are we responding to climate, how we're we making sure that we're both supporting the communities, but also in our own operations uh, helping. Um, and, and, you know, a small thing I'll say about, uh, not small, but it's an important piece, uh, also on our, um, on our fleet. We have a significant fleet. We have over 600 vehicles, and um, we've been working uh, over the last few years both to, to continue to electrify our fleet, so we've got some fully electric vehicles now and lots of hybrids, uh, but also reducing, reducing the mileage, for example, by looking at our maintenance routes and looking at our, where our maintenance facilities are just to, to reduce the number of miles that these vehicles have to be on the road. Uh, and then, of course, as part of the mayor's uh, vehicle reduction uh, mandate this year. Uh, we're committed to reducing our fleet in 2020 by, I think, uh, 20, 20, um, 26 vehicles, so we'll continue to work on that. Great. Um, Councilmember Mosqueda has a question. Sure. I don't know if it has anything to do with child care at community centers, but... No, I will, I will let you ask that. I actually was going to ask the Seattle City Light question. Um, earlier this week, we approved the Seattle City Light pilot project on um, electric, char electric charging for fleets, and they talked a little bit about partnership with uh, private business. Our question was, what are we doing to actually make this um, approach apply within the city of uh, Seattle department? So is Parks working with City Light on this pilot for electric vehicle? We are. We are. We had actually identified two sites that we were going to work with them on installing charging facilities. Uh, at the end, one of them uh, decided not to do it because there were some other private facilities there, but we're continuing to look for, for places, and we actually installed, for example, at our own headquarters, we installed a couple of charging stations. Okay, and yeah. I think our, the big message that we've been saying is uh, we understand the importance of launching these pilots in anticipation of a 2021 um, rate change, but uh, any feedback that you all can give us early about how we can take this to scale, especially in-house, um, so we can get our vehicles charging uh, faster would be great, so I'm glad that you guys are working in partnership. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember O'Brien. Thanks. I appreciate um, the Seattle, the Green New Deal Seattle um, on this slide, and especially since it just passed a month ago. And so I imagine that there's thinking on that. But I'd love just a little more detail about um, uh, conceptually where you think parks fix into the Green New Deal or what the thinking's been like. So I, I think I think. Generally, for us is uh, again, as I mentioned, it's twofold. So one is one is how do we continue to to support and, and, and educate our community? So there's a support part in terms of how we make sure that our neediest communities get the the, the things like like the, the respite from these these events. And I think the other aspect is just our own operations. Uh, so looking at uh, all of the the impact that we have on the environment, how we could reduce our own emissions, reduce that impact. Uh, and then I think that the third piece also is our continued work on on the the. Um, the uh, re the restoration of our forest right half of our half of our 6200 acres is is undeveloped parkland uh, and through the green seattle partnership i think we've done a lot of tremendous work that we need to continue to build on and continue to to both plant sort of find the right balance between planting native species but also hardier species because the climate is changing so uh, for us 20, 2020 really is going to be a big year of just evaluating sort of where where are the places where we can continue to support that um, I appreciate the, the mention of Green Seattle Partnership and Councilmember Pacheco's uh, committee earlier this week had a great presentation on that and it's really a really a great program. Um, um, the other thing I just want to flag because I think parks uh, could play a role in this. One of the concepts embedded in the Green New Deal for Seattle um, is this concept they're calling, uh, community members are calling green zones. And the idea is um, identifying geographic areas within the city, and it's a concept that comes out of the state of California, but identifying geographic areas in the city that uh, where the, the people there have largely been uh, adversely impacted by both you know, environmental and economic injustice. 
Um, and so the first part is identifying those areas. We, we actually talk a lot about certain neighborhoods in Seattle and how they perform differently than others. So, um, we, you know, how we would actually measure that and get to it is a little bit of work, but it's, it's not too much of a stretch to figure out where that would be. Um, and then figuring out what are the deep investments we do in those communities to essentially reverse those trends. And again, that's not a concept that's frankly new to the city. We've, we've been doing a lot of those types of things, but I do think there's an effort to um, really focus it um, and, and you know, take some of the existing things we've done. And parks obviously, um, park facilities plays a role. Parks uh, can play a great role in the outreach to communities to try and to identify green zones and what are the types of investments. And so those are things that I've just flagged for uh, potential opportunities as we think about Green New Deal next year. Yeah, thank you, mm -hmm. that's great. And uh, just to um, pile on a little bit, but also to acknowledge the good work that uh, your office department has done in the last 10 years, I know you did quite an analysis on making sure that every neighborhood is within, what, a quarter mile of some either green space or park, either whether it is... A 10-minute walk concept, yeah. And yeah. Um, can you, either right now or before we end up on our budget conversations, tell me, how, we do, how are we doing on that? We're actually doing pretty well. We're, you know, depending on sort of the metrics uh, that you look at, we're, I think we're at 94% of our residents are within a 10 minute walk to, to a park and open space. But I think that the, the challenge uh, is gonna continue to, to increase both from, the, from the, the, the basic sort of availability of land to acquire, um, as well as when we look at where the gaps are and sort of, if we go just straight by the numbers, uh, and then we, we outline an acquisition plan that just looks at creating that access, uh, we, we sort of undermine some of our own equity goals, for example. So there are some areas in the city that, that when you look at the metric, don't have a lot of, uh, don't have that, ten, don't, meet, don't meet that criteria for a 10 minute walk access. But, but these are communities that have large yards, bigger, you know, single family housing with, with, with they have open space already there. And, and some of our communities that don't have that, um, it, it, they already have sort of, they have parks in that neighborhood, but there aren't enough of them. And, and so when we think about it, like I'm, I'm excited to continue to push to, to get that criteria, but I think we also need to rethink how we're doing that and talk about quality for one and sort of the kind of activation that's happening. And then also, and, and Councilman, I think you and I have talked about this as well, is thinking about non-parks and recreation land as well as part of how we create the access. So whether it's, you know, the rights of way, whether it's other, you know, the, the, the publicly owned private spaces that create this access for our neighbors. Or, or, uh, so, so we just, I, I guess my point is we have to really think about um, that criteria in, 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 in new ways and not just focus on, on the, the buying another park in every community because that's going to be increasingly more difficult. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so going on to the next slide, and, and I alluded to this a little bit, but but for you know for 2020, we're one of the key areas that we're going to focus on is we're going to uh, uh, make a recommendation to the mayor and, and to you all about the next second six-year cycle of the park district. Um, but a lot of the work that we're doing in 2019 is actually helping drive that. And so currently, as, as council might know, we're in the middle of an engagement uh, process for a strategic plan that will help us guide, create priorities for the next six to 12 years, and and not just for park district investments for but for everything we do and so the idea there is we look at the the where Seattle is now and and we see new numbers like what what director Lee brought up uh, earlier today that that just continue to reinforce this idea that we live in a different Seattle than we've lived that, than we've lived in the past and so how do we make sure that the work of parks and recreation keeps up with that and continues to meet the needs of our residents so this the strategic plan will create the, the roadmap of priorities uh, that will then inform uh, the next level of engagement on the park district financial plan um, and I did want to sort of share a little bit about the, the sort of what's driving um, this, this, uh, these priorities because it will absolutely inform uh, the 2021 through 2026 Park District and beyond. Uh, and, and this set of values that are really driving our planning and, and we're looking at this idea that, that alluding to some of the things you brought up, Councilman Baxter, already is this idea that we fundamentally serve people and people of all ages. And so it isn't just about, you know, building more stuff or buying more land. It's how do we make sure that, that we're doing it based on their needs and the, and the things that they're telling us that, that are important to them. Uh, and so really making sure that this, this, these strategies are really people focused and program focused. Uh, and as we're doing that, understanding that there are some communities, uh, as you said, Councilman O'Brien, that just not, not, have been just disparately impacted by some of the challenges here. And so how do we double down on this equity conversation and racial equity conversation? So when we have conversations about investments, uh, they have to be driven by, a, by an equity framework. Uh, and some of the other pieces that are important to us is, is this idea that because our city's changing and 
or the needs of our residents are changing, we can't rely on the same strategies we've relied on in the past to do the work that we do, both internally in terms of how we operate, but also sort of the expectations of our communities. So one small example that would be, um, you know, we continue to get new new requests for different types of uses. Uh, so this idea that we, we, we no longer can afford to build, for example, a single use space. So if we're going to build a new court, it's got to be a court that works for tennis and for pickleball and for futsal and, and, and you name it. So this idea that shifting the conversation around, like I don't, you know, an athletic field that 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 that, that serves one particular use just isn't isn't really responsible anymore. Um, and a couple of other things I'll say is, is you know, because of the, we serve people and we're focusing on, on the, the neediest folks, uh, our engagement has to continue to evolve and, and, and ensure that we're, we're actually hearing from and talking to everyone. I'm actually really proud and happy to announce that the, the engagement process that's led to, that, that, that's ongoing now with the strategic plan, we've actually uh, achieved over 10,000 people who have given us feedback on the work that we do. Uh, and we've done it in, in a variety of ways. So, so we've done, we've gone out to community, I've gone out and we've gone out to, to events and, and talk to folks at community groups. We've met with a lot of our partners. Um, but you know, we've also had a lot of social media um, uh, campaigning, both in, 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 in English as well as in seven other languages. We've done a st statistically valid survey that really builds on one we did three years ago. And we actually even hired some uh, community engagement ambassadors that go door to door and, and survey the residents in various languages, just again, to try to get at the folks that don't always come to these meetings. So um, some, of the, some of that, all of that engagement is really informing the strategies that will then uh, guide some of the planning for the tw for the next cycle of the park district. That's great, and I'm sure um, Councilmember Gonzalez uh, is teaching us to make sure that we're asking for that people who are in the middle of the neighborhood and that they know the language and they know the culture and that we are working with them and asking them to help reach the neighbors and it's not just us internally doing that work. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for highlighting that. Yeah. And, and I will say that in addition to, to making sure we're doing it the right way, is making sure that we're doing it often and, and deliberately so there isn't a one-time conversation. Right, exactly. To, to Good for now. you. <clears throat> um, sure. Please, Councilmember Muscata, I think I'm, that's you down there. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Are you still, uh, do you have more to cover on slide two here? Okay. No, thank you. Um, in the proposed budget, is it appropriate to ask questions right here about the impact on the golf courses? Our analysis was that there was $12.3 million to manage the city's four golf courses, Jackson, Jefferson, West Seattle, and Inner Bay. And um, I am concerned based on some of the initial data and I um, would defer to central staff or others to talk about what the, the statement of legislative intent report said back to us. I'm still not seeing the equity analysis in why we would be putting over $12 million into golf courses, uh, especially when we have a, a need for um, those park services to be retrofitted across the city. You have extremely high needs in our community centers. Um, I guess my big question is, uh, what is this dollar, what are these dollars going towards? Do we have a sense of equity um, in terms of who we're serving? And are we trying to encourage more people to attend or are we going to maybe scope the way in which we use that land to maybe nine holes or something like that so we can do more uh, affordable housing and childcare and things like that on the land if it's not fully being utilized? Yeah. So, so that, that exact question is, is what the mayor has asked, charged us to sort of figure out. So, Certainly, we've done studies on on, on the, the different fiscal models, and we, we, we can tell you where people are coming from, and we can do some of that analysis. But really, she's asked us to take a closer look to see what's the appropriate use of this land. And so not, not just the $12.5 million, but the, the, the hundreds of acres that we're investing in this, this activity. Um, so we're, we're working with our, our, our colleagues at other agencies to try to identify all of those issues. You know, what are the equity implications? What are the land use implications, et cetera, so that we will identify all of the, all of the considerations that we have to to look at to figure out what the best use of this land is and, and certainly whether whether there's other appropriate uses, uh, different kinds of recreational activities that are that are more that are more inclusive, uh, as well as other things like housing and things like that, given given the challenges. Did we run so into an I forty two problem with that, with a golf course? The, the, our initiative forty two, that if we decide that we're going to uh, repurpose, even and using Councilmember Mosqueda's suggestion that we have nine holes rather than 18 holes sure. at the Big Four. Um, do we run into uh, the I-42 issue where we would have to provide other sure. parcels of and, park 
somewhere in the in the area. Yeah, no, and that that is uh, you know again, and that that is that is why we have to look very closely and deliberately because there's lots of issues like that. Whether it's I-42, other land use issues, there's environmental considerations, for example, in some of the golf courses where, uh, particularly Jackson Golf Course, has some real environmental environmentally critical areas that if we think about doing other things, we have to keep those in consideration. But yes, that there's lots of challenges uh, to to shifting the use. I just real quick, Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, uh, remind me when the report will come back to us. The, the analysis. Oh, uh, we're actually sending up an interdepartmental team uh, that we're going to launch this fall. That so we're anticipating probably by the end of the first quarter next year we'll have some information. Okay, yeah. this fall being right, Sorry, now, right now, 2019. Yes. Okay, yeah, right. um, and then. I don't know where this fits in, but um, I've had the chance to talk to a number of families across the city who um, would love to have access to more water parks and the um, kiddie pools. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that not all of them are open five or even seven days a week. Um, for example, the one around the corner from my house is open three days a week. I think it's a Sunday or maybe a Monday, Tuesday, and then a Thursday um, between limited hours. So um, is there a call from community? Have you heard more folks asking for additional kiddie pools to stay open? I know that we've opened a handful of water parks, which is really exciting. People love those. Yeah. Um, but anything else that we can do to help address the growing number of children at record yeah. numbers in the city so that families have a place to go at our city parks? Yeah, and, and we could either, there, there's a budget item that we could talk about, or, or you want to wait till we get through the slide. I'm happy to kind of talk through it a little bit now, or wh whatever your preference is. But sure. do you want to go through? It? Um, sure. Or we why don't we wait till the sure. fourth okay. slide? Sure. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So the next slide shows a four-year budget summary for parks. It's an over, overview showing the 2017 and 18 actuals, the 2019 adopted, and the 2020 proposed budget. Um, in the subsequent slide, we're going to get into some more details about our budget. Um, but this slide um, shows that our total budget for 2020 is approximately $262 million, which is about $24 million more than the 19 adopted. And a large portion of this is due to uh, wage inflation, which we'll talk about in the subsequent slide. The first three rows of this table show general fund appropriation changes by year. The 2020 proposed general fund budget is 100 and close to $105 million. It reflects a $5.7 million increase over 2019, um, or 6%, and that's primarily due to um, wage inflation. The next two sections show dollar and percent changes to all other operating funds, which include the park fund, which is where our earned revenues are received, as well as the park district funds, and all capital funds, such as REIT and King County levy. Um, the 8% increase in 2020 accounts for wage inflation in the park fund and park district, and the 17% capital appropriation increase primarily reflects the start of the aquarium expansion project. The last three rows highlight our FTE changes year after year from 2017 through 2020. Um, as you can see, it's about a 1% increase per year. In 2018, we received additional encampment resources, which explains that increase. In 2019, we added five positions in various program areas, accounting for that increase over 2018. And then in the 2020 proposed budget, um, this includes FTE changes that were included in the 19 adopted budget as well as the 2020 endorsed. We added maintenance staff in the 2020 endorsed budget to support maintenance of newly opened and park, newly opened land bank sites that were funded by the park district. And in 2020, we also have some budget neutral ads, which we'll be discussing in the set, subsequent slide. Great. Um, quick, quick question on this. When we passed the Metropolitan Park District in 2014, we had promised the voters that we would have a certain percentage of the parks budget always maintained from through the general fund. Can you reassure us on these numbers that we are consistent with that? And I think it was what seventy some percentage of the total total budget. We can, and if I recall, it's actually a dollar amount that in, that's indexed to inflation rather than a percentage of the overall budget. Um, and we have been over that figure, and, I, and, and uh, we'll be again. Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. So this next slide highlights major um, proposed 2020 budget changes. We have four sections to walk through. Um, 
the first clarification, though, I want to make is that these dollars are not in thousands, <laughs> even though it says it on the slide. So please disregard the title, thousands at the top. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, $150 million. Yeah. Uh -huh. That was one. Anyway, <laughs> so the first. We become the federal Department of Parks and Recreation. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the first section um, is about um, efficiencies to improve customer service, and to get to the um, first item on aquatic equity initiatives. Um, we the, just a general quick statement about this is that we're repurposing funding to equalize our service levels at 22 waiting pools, and then we're allowing ourselves to invest in other um, aquatic equity initiatives like eliminating the low-income um, swimming fee, swimming fee. So, just to give a little bit more background on this, in 2018, City Council increased SPR's waiting pool budget to increase service levels at our waiting pools, and that was an increase from 15 to 22. The 19 uh, budget did not include that service level, but we were able to identify one-time resources to sustain that or to for that year. And then in 2020, we received an additional $150,000 via a green sheet, and that included $70,000 to maintain those service levels at the 22 waiting pools um, or 709 days as had been done in 2018 and with one-time resources in 2019. And then additionally, we received, as part of that $150,000, $80,000 to increase the waiting pool hours to an unspecified level of operating days. And what are we, or what we are proposing in this uh, proposed budget is to maintain the 22 waiting pool service level, um, service level and rededicate the $80,000 to um, cover drop-in swim fees for low-income in youth and also um, expand our lifeguard program to youth and we would be recruiting diverse um, youth into the program. And the reason that we um, believe that this is important is that it'll help us support the youth who are receiving scholarships for swimming lessons. Um, and allow them to have more access to indoor pools so that they can practice their swim, swims. Do we still have the Women of the World uh, schedule for some of our swimming pools? <laughs> you know? We do. We do. Um, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> We're, we're, you know, we're doing some some work with with Office of Civil Rights and just making sure that we're 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 complying with with everything we need to comply with. But yeah, Councilmember Mosqueda, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, just briefly, uh, I understand from my colleague we have uh, a lot of appreciation for Councilmember uh, Johnson, Rob Johnson, who advocated for this in his tenure here. Um, do we have any feedback from community about? ways in which we could better monitor access and utilization. My understanding is that the wade pools uh, or the kiddie pools are being um, monitored and each of the staff there need to check off how many people attend each day and that attendance or the presence of families will or will not determine future funding for those wade pools. So right. it feels like a performance-based contract in yeah. some ways uh, with the community. And if people don't know about the wade pools or if people are getting displaced or if there's new people moving in and they're not aware, how do we do a better job of doing outreach and education when sometimes those wade pools um, don't have regular hours? If they're off hours or if they're um, alternating days, families might not be aware and they see it one day with no water in it um, and then they just decide not to go back. So what are we doing for outreach and education to the neighborhood so that if we're measuring success of those weight pools, it's not just based on word of mouth? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think I think partially what we're, we're trying to do, because to your point about the consistency and the messaging, is just having better signage so people understand that. And, and, but you're right, the, the, the decisions about which pool to be open one, what days are, is really based on, on the use data, like, like our guards go around and they count and sort of we, we figure out how much money we have to invest in and we sort of create that. And I think, I think the, the operating the, the 22 pools is, I think it's worked. To give you an example of the, of the total 
available hours and days um, the, because of weather and attendance and all that, we think that's the right number and that's why we're proposing to, to continue that because it is an increase, but then also to, to continue to try to further some of our other equity goals to, to ensure, because broadly I think one of our, one of our uh, concerns, given that we live in a city surrounded by water and given some of the disparities, for example, in dra drowning rates with people of color, is much, much higher. Uh, this is one where we're trying to ad address that as well, maintain the levels, but also add some additional equity focus. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Do you want to continue, Donnie? I have a question. Oh, do you? Okay, sorry. Councilmember Gonzalez. Oh, thank you, um, Chair Bagshaw. I just wanted to um, um, dig in a little bit on a couple of, um, excuse me, a couple of areas that, uh, one area that's highlighted on the presentation, one area that is not. I'm happy to um, cover both of those now or? Okay, so on um, in the actual budget book on page um, 104, oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, page 108, um, it, it spends a little bit of time talking about the Seattle Conservation Corps, and in particular, it, um, it looks like there's a modest increase to the Seattle Conservation Corps program. Um, for uh, the proposed budget in 2020. The budgeting for Seattle Conservation Corps has remained relatively flat over the last several um, years. And of course, I, I know that um, personally, I'm a big fan of the program and for folks who um, are on the dais or in community and are unfamiliar with the program, this has been a program that's been around the city since 1986 and uh, provides employment for <coughs> people. It's a, it's a city run employment prep program effectively for uh, people experiencing homelessness, primary, primarily adults. Very popular program that really teaches folks job skills and um, preparation. And so I sort of see this aligned with the conversation we just had with the Office of Economic Development around um, around uh, getting prepared for what it what might be coming in in job in the job in the recession and also what we saw from the city budget office presentation yesterday which really highlighted that we can anticipate a, a reduction uh, in job growth over the coming few years so um, that's just my uh, uh, introductory remarks to really wanting to hear a little bit more from you superintendent around how we are connecting the dots for folks who are participating in the uh, Conservation Core program with meaningful employment afterwards. I know that there is some anecdotal evidence of uh, folks who participate in that program being permanently hired or otherwise gainfully employed with the Seattle Parks and Recreation Department. Um, but I'd like to get a better sense from you about how we, um, how we're actually tracking some of that information so that it's less anecdotal and more, right. more evidence-based. Um, and, and then secondly, you know, we heard from the Office of Economic Development about some of the workforce development um, investments that they're going to be making. Would like to get a sense from you about how you envision an opportunity to collaborate and coordinate with OED. And then, of course, we have our Seattle Promise program through the uh, Department of Education and Early Learning and uh, funded through our FEP levy. And uh, again, just really want to get a sense from you about how you are seeing an opportunity to connect the dots for folks who are participating in the program, getting these important skill sets, uh, but need that extra assistance in being able to achieve gainful employment and job placement as as a critical part of, I think, our overall economic development strategy and uh, and our overall strategy to address the uh, needs of people experiencing homelessness. Yeah. Yes. So, I think so. So certainly, the the Conservation Corps is is an, an incredibly valuable um, program that that we operate. And as you said, Councilmember, it, it, it's a very specific program that's designed to to both. Uh, lead to employment, but also it, we do a lot of case management, for example, and we really work with these individuals who are experiencing homelessness as well as, in, in many cases, uh, issues with drug abuse and things like that. And so, so it's a program that, that we've, we've uh, really focused on developing
developing the, the life skills and the job skills and connecting them to housing, connecting them to other services, and then also connecting them to jobs. And I, I don't have the data in front of me in terms of how many people we hire. We can get you that. But, but the idea is we need you to be doing more of how we connect them to other opportunities for employment. Um, and, and all of the things that you mentioned are exactly the places we should look at it, and not just, frankly, with the Conservation Corps, but with a lot of our youth programming, for example. You mentioned the Seattle Promise. I think we're, we're working to think about how do we create pipelines for the, for, the, for the young folks who participate in our programs to continue to get engaged, whether they're in green jobs or, or, or other things like that. So, you know, it's an area that, that, that we need to do more work on and sort of really, really sort of improve the programs that we're offering now. Like, we do a lot of summer programs where we provide jobs for kids and give them stipends. I think we need to do a better job of connecting that to the next step. And, and particularly with, with the, the Promise, I think there's conversations at the city how we do that. Um, I, I, I do think, though, with, with, the, with the Conservation Corps, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about whether whether we expand it and what do we do with it. And I think, you know, part of my interest right now is is, is continue to improve it and 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 begin to to do a better job of collecting that data so it's not anecdotal. Uh, one shift that we did this year, just organizationally, uh, is move that um, the, the 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 oversight of that group to a, to a, a different uh, division that's really most more focused on partnerships and it's actually located there on the facility you know on at Magnuson Park with the conservation Corps so that that team could get more support so that we can begin to get do a better job of, of articulating sort of the value of that program and then tracking those participants great yeah. um, I, I really appreciate that and um, you know I, know I know that resource I know that our city resources and dollars are very limited um, so as much as um, I'd like to be able to pitch an opportunity to uh, create a, a financial expansion opportunity for the program I also recognize that um, we have a, a little ways to go perhaps before we have that type of a conversation because I think we really need to tighten up our understanding of um, the effectiveness and the outcomes that uh, were seen um, as as part of the four million dollar investment, muscle minerals, muscle minerals, yeah. um, four million dollar investment um, per year that we're seeing in this program. I mean, it's not an insignificant investment, um, but I do think it would be helpful to to get a clearer sense of exactly um, what this investment is is producing in terms of positive outcomes and results for the people who are participating in it. I've had an opportunity to meet with a lot of the folks um, in the past who are participating in the Conservation Corps program and have been um, both inspired and overwhelmed by the complexity of um, the um, issues that, that many of the core participants face and have been you know, really impressed with the amount of, um, the amount of care that Seattle Parks and Recreation uh, staff and employees have um, invested in, in that program, both in the youth and the adult uh, programming context. Yeah. That's all my questions on the, on the Conservation Corps um, area, but I did have some questions around the proposed expansion using sugary, uh, excuse me, sweetened beverage tax funds for recreation programming. I'm happy to hold on that if others Thank have you. questions. I, I or think Council President Harrell had a question he wanted to dive Thank you, Chair. With. I'm not sure. Sorry, is this weird? Uh, at least I'm going to bounce around a little bit. I just had one question on the um, RV remediation efforts, but had you even gotten to that yet, or should I? On the one on the, we haven't. The, RV. the RV remediation efforts is 100,000. On I don't know if I'll just ask the question because sure. we're sort of um, ad libbing it here a little bit. I, I understand that's we're going to do. I think the council a little deeper dive in a, in other developments, but I was just trying to figure out your piece of the, our efforts. Is that an FTE or this or this park property that may cost you for lack of use? What, what, what is that piece of your of the RV remediation that we're increasing by 100 percent? Yeah, Donnie's telling me that, it, that it's labor and supplies. You know, as you know, we already participate in the navigation team and, and both in rights of way and non rights of way cleanups. Uh, so so these additional funds would be additional costs associated with addressing that. So for the supplies, labor and supplies yeah, for us. So, so, for okay, the, so more, so some FTEs devoting more time correct. and some supplies. So that's probably okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Follow up. Great. Yeah, Councilmember Mosqueda, and then just to back to Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank, thank you. you. Just to follow up on that. So, um, in the hundred thousand dollars that's being proposed to expand the um, RV remediation program, 
additional sites that are not currently covered by the city's RV remediation program. Um, if this is an expansion of our efforts around the navigation team, what types of activities are we talking about? What additional locations are we planning to go to? And my final question might be related to the one I asked yesterday. Is this part of the $7 million that we are not transitioning over to the regional governance effort if it's tied into the navigation team? I think the answer on the second is yes, but I think um, both because I don't have the information, I don't think um, uh, Jesus does either. To better to bring you a, a kind of comprehensive presentation about, excuse me, presentation about the navigation team work and the RV uh, remediation work um, as part of the homelessness briefing on Wednesday. And I'm, I'm not trying to dodge it. I just think we'll all get a, um, a better um, perspective on the um, on the, the proposed additions and and the and the functions that they're funding. Great. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. And I, just as a reminder to my colleagues, we will be diving into the investments around homelessness next Tuesday. We're going to spend the whole day on that. So um, any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to raise them now because we can give an alert to the departments that we're going to be asking them again. But I don't think we're sliding as we're, we're going to have a whole day devoted to it. Good. Did you have another question? Um, I do, but I think Councilmember Herbold has something okay. related to hygiene that might be a little bit more provide continuity here and then I'll if I can have an opportunity to ask some questions about the proposed expansion of recreation programming I'd appreciate that Sure, appreciate it so um, the uh, Seattle Parks and Recreation budget has um, a uh, $99,000 line item for the Portland Lou um, and this is a really important investment to um, create rest uh, restroom um, that is accessible to for all visitors to um, the park that it's located in regardless of their housing status. Um, we uh, worked with the city auditor to um, audit the city's activities um, around the navigation team and one of its um, one of its recommendations was focused um, on uh, opportunities that specifically the parks department has to um, fund available um, bathroom and hygiene facilities that SP, uh, parks already has in its portfolio um, and there's of course uh, an understandably uh, concern about the capacity to staff those kinds of facilities um, and so specifically the city auditor was um, interested in looking at an expansion to um, include um, hygiene facilities um, in uh, several community centers that have access to um, to showers. Currently, Del Ridge, Green Lake, Miller, and Rainier all provide showers to non-program participants. So equal access to all, but there are um, about six other community centers that have showers um, that don't provide this level of service to non-program participants. Um, so as I've had discussions uh, with you, Director, I've, I've expressed it, uh, a strong interest in looking at whether or not we could um, either expand the hours at the four locations that currently provide this service or um, include it in additional community centers. Um, and then the other, um, the other piece that they've, um, they've pegged is, uh, they being the auditor, is the opportunities that may be provided in the city's, um, the Parks Department's comfort stations, um, and whether or not we could pursue um, a staffed, um, some staffing of those comfort stations. They don't have showers, but they certainly have restrooms. Um, and um, I think folks um, have come to the conclusion that staffing these facilities is really the key um, to addressing um, the uh, challenges that are presented uh, in providing this uh, essential need. So I'm just really interested in um, how we could move uh, this conversation um, as recommended by the city auditor um, and go beyond just investing in a single uh, bathroom facility in one part of the city um, versus others throughout the city. Sure, I, I think I think you did a great job of highlighting all of the the challenges for sure, and I think I think certainly I, I agree with you that that providing access to restroom facilities uh, for extended periods of time during the day 
fundamentally, it's going to be really difficult to do that in a way that, that's safe and, and actually truly makes these accessible unless we staff them. And I think that's the fundamental challenge. And then it's who's going to staff them and, and sort of uh, what does that mean when we're staffing them. And I think that the pilot that we're doing, for example, with Portland Lou is, is, is one attempt to sort of get halfway there in terms of, you know, the design of this bathroom was specifically intended to, to, um, to, to help create access without necessarily having staffing. But at the end of the day, I, I, think, I think that it's going to be hard to get away from, from sort of the need to have a, a person there keeping an eye on things, so, which, which is a significant shift in the way we've been doing things with our, with our, with our uh, restroom facility. So um, I'm happy to talk more. And, and you know, in terms of the showering, uh, you know, our staff really, really appreciates being able to provide that service at those four facilities. And, and you know, the use varies. I think Delridge and Green Lake are the ones that get tremendous amount of use on a weekly basis. The others are, are not as much. Um, I, I would also, you know, so we can be happy to talk about more facilities that have that available. But, but at the same time, you know, our, our swimming pools and other areas that have showers, uh, we do, and, and maybe we should we should clarify even more and do a better job of talking to our staff about this. But, but anyone who comes into that building, you don't have to be, you know, signing up for a for a swim lesson to use the shower facilities. I think I think that they're still accessible. Maybe we don't advertise them as such, and we can sort of work with the staff to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the fundamental sort of answer to your question is yes. I mean, we're happy to engage in, in more of those discussions. Um, and for all of our residents, I think, you know, the, the, the single largest complaint, although may, maybe one of the top two, is, is the, the condition of our restroom facilities and, and the accessibility of our restroom facilities and all of our parks and all of our community centers. Um, so. so just as a follow-up, it, it would be helpful to understand um, why it is, and if it's just a matter of uh, it being made known to the public, but the city auditor identified uh, six community centers as being community centers with, with showers restricted to program participants. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there's some essential difference between those, what, what's happening at those six yeah. centers versus the other four, sure. um, I really would like to understand that. Yeah, more. no, I, I, think, I think that the essential difference is, is those four were identified and, and sort of identified and, and uh, advertised sort of through our partnerships, but also is um, uh, the, the staff there is, is charged with and, and, and prepared to, to provide resources and towels and things like that, which also become a challenge. Um, I think the other sites just were not selected as, as sites to provide the services. Um, but, but if, so, so there is capacity there if we choose to do that. And, and part of it is sort of staff education. The other part is really understanding kind of what, what, what we need to provide that staff in that facility to make sure that they're open. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I would just like to underscore what uh, Councilmember Herbold just raised. This is something that we've discussed, I think, every single year that I've been on this council. And the more we can just open up these public facilities, because we spend a lot of money in things like our urban rest stop. And if we already have something built and available, it makes a lot more sense to me to be able to open them up to people who need the showers. I mean, it all comes right back to a public health issue. And with regard to funding somebody that is monitoring, I know that we've discussed the San Francisco model. I think they've got, what, 14 or 15 of their places. And they're, they're working through their water departments, our equivalent of SPU. And I'm not suggesting that we go scrap money from SPU at this point. But I do want to say we've got to look at this as a system again sure. that it, it ties in for your facilities, but also SBU has to clean up if things are a mess. Business owners, you know, they write to us every day saying, you know, the first thing we do in the morning is get the hose out. Yeah. Because if people don't have a place to go, they're going to go where they can. And um, it strikes me that we've already got these facilities built, and there's six more that we can open up. I'd really encourage us to take a look at that seriously and get them open up in 2020. Yeah, thank you. And I will add one, one other piece because I think it's, it's important, and, and that is we want to make sure that as we open up, whether it's these six or some some portion of those six, that we do provide the staff with that resource. Uh, I think when you when you think about the other facilities that are having high use, you know our staff sometimes struggles with with uh, making sure that they're prepared for the the types of interactions that they're going to encounter as folks come into those buildings. So we want to right. make sure we do that. Uh, and then you mentioned the the San Francisco model. I think part of what what our, our work is also to learn and and sort of collaborate with others. We actually just hosted the 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 entire executive team of the Seattle. I mean. 
the, the San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department to come down and do some of this conversation. We had lots of conversations about restroom facilities and staffing and, and, and encampments and all of that. So, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to learn from their model and we're hopefully going to go visit them. So thank too. you. Um, and just a thank you to you and your staff again for the amazing work that you did during our February snow. Absolutely. And I know they had, they, your staff, were in many cases staying overnight there. Uh, keeping things open and, and one of the uh, exchanges that we had afterwards is a sense of well if we had a, we need a little more training in that arena and provide support to you and your staff but I do want to say thank you that was a yeoman's effort um, on, a, on a rugged time for a lot of people yeah, Thanks. And to, to quote the Human Services Department, together we saved lives during that winter storm. Right, and, so and, and a number of our, our local companies, too. Yeah. I know that Starbucks and Vulcan and others dived right in bringing food, but it was a thank you. It was, it, this is a thank you opportunity, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you. Chair Bagshaw, may I ask Please. my question yeah. now? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, I really appreciate the conversation around the additional ways for us to meet the hygiene needs, which is really a public health need of um, individuals who uh, don't have ready access to uh, to toileting. So uh, on that note, before I ask my question, I did want to um, ex express a note of gratitude to um, the Seattle Parks and Recreation Department around the Ballard Cam Commons Park um, investment that I uh, championed last year during our budget cycle. So um, really excited to see the rollout of uh, that programming and opportunity within Ballard Commons Park to provide those hygiene services uh, coupled with uh, staff and programming. So um, looking forward to getting a report back on hopefully what will be a story of successes by Seattle Parks and Recreation in terms of the launching of that particular uh, program and partnership with the Ballard Alliance. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and then in terms of the recreation programming, which uh, shows up as being um, funded through the sweetened beverage tax funds, that's an additional $150,000 a year. I believe it's ongoing, if I recall correctly. Um, setting us, yesterday I asked questions around um, uh, wanting to have a citation to the specific portion of the sweetened beverage tax ordinance that supports the utilization of these funds for um, this kind of programming. Uh, setting that question aside, because I, I uh, trust that our uh, Council Central staff has flagged that as an issue and we'll do some analysis there. I'm actually prepared to answer it now if it's helpful. Okay. Can I ask a few questions of first course. and then we can get that up. answer from you? Um, so the budget book on page 103 talks about um, what the intended programs will be funded through this program, and there's two of them. One is destination summer camps, and the second is summer of safety. And so there's a, a little bit more granular detail on the destination summer camps, uh, which are described as being highly subsidized, low-fee activity camps cited in low-income neighborhoods. And then it highlights to a piloted program at Garfield Community Center, um, that had about 580 program um, registrations associated with it. There's a little less detail about the Summer of Safety program other than saying that it's a free structured recreation for youth that aren't otherwise engaged in formal programming. Um, and it talks about how currently the program, the Summer of Safety program offers um, uh, uh, services three to four days a week at four locations. I was hoping, uh, Superintendent, that you can provide a little bit more detail about the um, underlying types of programming and activities that are um, undertaken through both the Destination Summer Camp and the Summer of Safety program, and then ha and what this what you anticipate this expansion of one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year will actually. Um, uh, provide in terms of uh, kids or families or youth who will be able to access the services. Sure. Gonzalez? Um, to go back. Just to Gonzalez. add one more thing to Councilmember Gonzalez's line of questioning. Keep if track I'm... of all these questions coming your way. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I was going to add, because I had a very similar question, was the location. Citywide, yeah. where do we see these um, uh, locations that are not already specified in those two programs, the Destination Summer Camp and the Summer of Safety? Thank you. Great. Um, so, so going back to the, the destination summer camps, uh, as you said, Councilman Gonzalez, it, 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 this, this stemmed from a pilot that we looked at uh, where, where, so I think as the council knows, we have, we, we do a lot of summer camps across the city during the summer, and, and these, these are, 
what you imagine recreation summer camps to be for children, whether they're yeah, athletic camps and, and just, just the various bringing the kids in during the summer and going on trips and doing sort of acting, activating, getting, keeping them active, et cetera. But we found that there's a significant discrepancy, frankly, in the enrollment numbers at some of our communities, the higher income communities versus other communities. And so Garfield was one where we had very low enrollment. Uh, which, which to us uh, spoke to, to, to and, and this is even even for for families that have access to our scholarships. Or they're, they're still not enrolling. So, we piloted um, this this essentially running the same kind of camps that we do at, 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 uh, in other places, but with a with 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 no fee and and sort of not even the need necessarily to register, but just so the kids can show up and it would be structured. And that's when you know we enroll them as they would come in. So it was it was a lot easier for them to come in, um, and and we found that we. We had you know a huge spike in the in the enrollment and, and so clearly there was a need for these types of programs and so what we hope to do with with in 2020 is to continue to build on that increase and and those are as I said those are sort of our standard summer camp activities that we do across the city uh, I think that the the, the, um, the summer of safety uh, camps are are also you know sort of traditional things that that, that we and other parts of recreation departments across the country do is just to provide activities for youth who won't sign up for camps and are just out there uh, looking for things to do. Um, and, and we look for ways to, to bring them indoors and connect them to some positive activities that maybe they're not as structured so we don't have a schedule for the week and, and, and kind of go through what we're doing. But uh, and, and just getting them engaged in, in, in physical activities, getting them engaged in uh, working uh, field trips and things like that. Uh, and, and that one's also important because we also provide meals uh, for the kids in the, in the um, summer of safety camps for the folks that don't have, mm -hmm. the kids that don't, don't have meals at home. Um, and, and, and as you said, it is uh, extending it to a five day. I, I don't have the, the sites in front of me, but, but these are in, in sort of the, the southeastern part of the city, but I can get you the site specifically where they are. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Good. All right, please, let's continue with the, our last slide because we do have Marty if, sitting out there waiting for us to get going with OLS. If I might, I could also take the opportunity to cite the relevant language, but or not. So if you're, yeah, I'm sorry, I totally forgot that no, you no, no, put no, a pin in that. Happy, happy to hear your response. Yeah, so the, the, I think the two pieces, the most significant one, um, I'm, I'm quoting from the amended ordinance, um, funding uh, ellipses, if you will, funding eligible, evidence-based programs that improve the social, emotional, education, physical, and mental health of children, especially those services that seek to reduce the disparities in outcomes for children and families based on race, gender, and other socioeconomic factors, and to prepare our children um, for kindergarten. That would be more on the education side. But the physical piece, um, I think, is, is the relevant one here. Also, um, given uh, that there, there is food provided, the, the food access piece as well. Um, but we'll provide you more, a more formal response. I just wanted you to know that. And I also, I don't want to quote the CAB, uh, the Citizens Advisory Board, um, but my general understanding is that they are supportive of these and see them as consistent as well. But it was a very good question and, and uh, drove me back to the ordinance. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Very okay. Good. So I'm just going to jump. Honey, you're, you're on again. <laughs> I'll just jump back up to uh, what we haven't covered so far. So the set under efficiencies. Formalize the commitment to team performing arts. Um, this formalizes um, a commitment to the teen, teen summer musical and other teen performing arts programming by creating a permanent funding source for this work through the reallocation of existing budget and recognition of $8,000 in unbudgeted revenues. I'm seeing 0% on this. It's a budget, these are all budget neutral changes. Okay. But right. we're. Gotcha. Okay. So then the next section is expanding and enhancing operations. We, we just talked about the SBT, so I think we can move on. Um, leverage ARC funds to add assistant coordinators. So this one is, let's see, let me find my notes. Um, this adds 3.5 assistant coordinator positions to support growing recreation programming needs at community centers, funded in part by an annual contribution by the Associated Recreation Council, which is 150,000, and by reducing our budget for temporary staffing. Partial funding for these positions was approved in the second quarter supplemental ordinance, and it provides ongoing budget and FTE authority to hire permanent positions that will serve Miller in the Northeast, Van Asselt, ID, Chinatown Community Center, in the Southeast High Point and South Park in the Southwest, 
and they will plan and coordinate program programming and facility safety at these sites. The next one I think we covered, so we can move on to updating the CIP, adding CDBG funding for ADA compliance. Where are my notes? Ah. Um, okay, so this one is that we, our baseline budget included 880,000 of community development block grant funding to support the Conservation Corps. The proposed CIP will, pro will provide um, additional $700,000 of one-time CDBG funds for ADA compliance, and this will supplement existing funding for this work in 2020 and further advance our efforts to make parks and recreation facilities more accessible for all. One thing to note is on the slide it shows um, a decrease, um, and that is because the 2020 proposed amount represent actually represents an increase over the 2020 endorsed budget of $1 million, but the 2020 endorsed is not showing on the slide. We also added $2 million of REIT beginning in 2021 to the Capital Improvement Program to continue this work. Okay. Good. Any questions? Okay. Okay. The next item is add REIT funding for Outdoors for All. So in 2019, Outdoors for All was awarded an RFP to renovate Building 18 at Magnuson Park to serve as the organization's future headquarters. Um, this organization enriches the quality of life for children and adults with disabilities through outdoor recreation. And the mayor's proposed budget, 2020 proposed budget, includes $1 million of one-time funding in our capital improvement program to assist outdoors for all with capital renovations at this facility. That's great. Um, I think many of us saw the video. And maybe, was that in your parks committee, mm -hmm. Councilmember Wars? Um, and if you haven't seen it, that short video on the value of outdoors for all is really inspiring. Um, is this, do you know how, uh, on their capital a campaign, how much they've raised? Will this million dollars close that gap? I don't think it closes it completely. They still have a little work to do, but they've raised most of what they need. Great, my good. Thank you. And I, I know having spoken, they're seeking and may have secured both uh, state funding um, and perhaps county funding as well. And, and I know this is another example of um, really productive partnerships we formed um, to, to seek the redevelopment um, of, of Magnuson Park. We have now a soccer facility, a tennis facility, um, soon uh, uh, a climbing facility. Um, again, and, and these have all been partnerships of one form or another and right. really turning what was uh, a tremendous asset into a ever more tremendous asset. Right. And just to um, pile on once again, uh, Building 11, of course, that's something that we worked on for the last 10 years um, where we've got uh, Cascade Bicycle Club. I think we've got a high school there, Waldorf Boyer High Clinic. School, the sailing, uh, sail standpoint. It's really been impressive work. So uh, again, thank you. Okay, under other changes, Elliott Bay Office Park lease costs. This November, we will have about 120 staff moving from the RDA building, which is in South um, International District area, up to the Elliott Bay Office Park on 300 Elliott. Um, the, city, the lease that was approved by the City Council in April of 2019 anticipated a $1.1 million um, lease, which is approximately 350000 more than what our existing lease is at the RDA, and that building lease is expiring at the end of this year. Okay, and that, of course, went through Councilmember Juarez's committee, and we grilled you at length about that, so thank you. <laughs> okay. 2020 annual wage increase, state paid FMLA. This centrally administered change adjusts appropriations to reflect the annual wage increase, as outlined in the tentative agreement between the city and the coalition of unions for personnel costs included in this department's baseline budget. And this includes um, salary, increases to salary, FICA, Medicare, retirement, overtime, and temporary, temporary labor, and the city's portion of the 2020 state paid medical leave. And the reason that this looks high with a 6% increase is because it includes two years of wage increases because when we adopted the 2019 budget at the end of 2018, it didn't, we didn't have the, the COLA in, included. So this, is, this includes two years of wage increases. 
And Ben, this is largely covered in something things that have been set aside in previous budgets, yeah, just exactly. so showing up as a specific line item here, right. but it's coming out of Finance General or something. We, we had the reserves um, and, uh, 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 stored up, if you will, as part of the endorsed budget, and they're now, for the 2020, they're now being distributed to the departments based on the, the um, tentative agreement. Um, the 2019 dollars, we will have to um, add to the 2019 budget retroactively, um, and we're um, exploring now whether that will happen late first qu for fourth quarter or, or early first, um, having to do with the timeline for negotiating the, the I, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the, the various labor agreements. So, yeah, um, so not a surprise it was anticipated and resources exist. Great. Thank you. Have a over 900 employees, so you can imagine that this this number is going to be larger than some of the other departments. You will also see it in. Thank you. All right, I think we're on to the last one. Last one, funding for increased utility rates. This item appropriates $1 million of one-time funding from the Park and Recreation Fund to cover utility rate increases. The utilities include sewer, drainage, water, electricity, gas, and recycling. Um, this is in response to SPU increasing utility rates um, annually, and we haven't been adequately budgeted to uh, pay for those, especially the drainage costs. So um, our total budget for utilities right now is about $14 million, and utility costs in 18 already exceeded that amount by about 400000 So we're going to evaluate actual operating expenses in in 2020 and then f propose a longer term solution that would be part of the development of the next park district funding plan. Very good. Thank you. Councilmember Boris, did you have something? No. Oh, oh, you're just cheering them on. Okay. Well, yes. uh, thank you. Councilmember O'Brien. So you mentioned this is a one time funding source, but it's an ongoing expense that we'll need to figure out. We just don't have that solution yet. Yep, exactly. All right. Before we let you go, I would love to talk to you a little bit more about the progress we're making on the Belltown Potential Park mm -hmm. and also seven years later on Smith Cove Park. I understand you got an RFP coming for me, so. Yeah, so, so I'll, uh, uh, Smith Cove quickly, as, as you know, Councilmember, we're working on that with you and others for a while. Um, there's two phases of that project. The first phase has been designed and will be going out for bid to, to begin the construction. Uh, the second phase will be one of the challenges that we'll take a look at for the second uh, uh, version of the park district. But um, yeah, the, the the Smith Cove is moving forward. It's an exciting Thank you. project. Thank you. Um, in terms of the the potential new park downtown, um, you know, we we're, we're in sort of the initial discussions where we've talked to the Office of Waterfront on sort of how do we take a look at it, what what is it going to look like, and so we've committed to working with them on some uh, preliminary engineering and design studies. Not sure yet how much it's going to cost because, as you can imagine, this park is a little different. There might be some engineering challenges just given given how it's being created. Uh, so we're going to continue to work with them on that to understand, but, but we've committed to and, and are excited to work with them. Thank yeah. you, and I think that's a great team, Waterfront and yeah. you, so I appreciate that very much. Okay, colleagues, Councilmember Herbal. Thank you. Um, not a great place for this question to fit, so I'm not going to try to fit it in <laughs> anywhere. But um, so I've been working over the last couple budget cycles on uh, issues related to um, animal control, specifically animal control in the parks. Um, and this year, our office observed that we weren't able to increase the animal control, control capacity, uh, specifically focused on monitored, monitoring leashed and unleashed areas in the parks. Uh, we funded uh, 14 um, uh, animal control officers, um, but since 2017, these positions haven't been filled completely because of turnover and promotions. And of those 14 positions, only four, um, two pairs are assigned, and the pairs are one parks employee, one uh, FAS employee, are assigned to focus on parks among the other responsibilities assigned to the role. So again, only two pairs for um, focus in the parks, uh, two pairs of uh, meaning four officers. So um, in 2019, we uh, added another FTE position, but it seems that this position is being deployed instead as uh, call volume allows and emphasis patrols, again, in, instead of focusing on the parks work that I think was um, was the intention. So we're just, um, I'm just wondering how we can um, work to find a better approach to allow for consistent coverage of, um, of the off-leash laws in the parks. 
Uh, happy to work with FAS on that. I think that the one FD that you mentioned was actually in, in their budget. I mean, we've got our two FDs there, but um, it's it's an important issue for us in the parks and we get, uh, I mentioned the, the, the <laughs> most complaints we get, the second most complaints we get is about off-leash uh, dogs in our parks. So. <laughs> Me too. <Yeah. laughs> Excellent. All right, any other questions, colleagues? All right, thank you very much, Don. Thank you. Um, Jesus, as always, it's a, a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Thank you. So our third item and the last one for this morning is our Office of Labor Standards. And I think Karina Brohl is going to join us at the table. Thank you so much uh, for everything that this team has done. So Karina, if you'll just come up to the table. And Marty, we're going to ask you to start introductions here as soon as everybody sits down and then I'm going to I have a give Karina a moment and anybody else up here on the panel want to introduce it all right Councilmember Mosqueda and then we're going to turn it over to Karina thank you thank you so much so I'm really excited to have the presentation from the Office of Labor Standards under the director um, direction of uh, Marty Garfinkel we're really excited about the work that has happened in just your short tenure here but I just wanted to take a uh, quick moment to celebrate all that OLS has been able to accomplish since April 1st 2015 Korean Bowl was a big part of that um, and as we've worked to both stand up the Office of Labor Standards this council has also asked you to take on more uh, as you've built the plane you have been flying it and we have been very honored to be able to work with you uh, to craft new labor standards to work on rulemaking and then to go out and do the important education and outreach that's necessary and also enforcement but your office has been really great about recognizing the need to really lead with education given some of these new labor standards that we have um, had the privilege of working on with you and quite frankly the honor of championing here in Seattle as we've shown to the rest of the country what it looks like to be a model for promoting labor standards for all and doing this collaborative outreach to, to small businesses um, and to really create partnerships with community as we've done that outreach and education. Uh, so some of the things that we're really excited about that are in this budget um, include outreach and education and enforcement on eight labor standards, staffing two boards and commissions, working with the community outreach and education funds and business outreach and business funds and working to harmonize our efforts here at the city with state laws with a lens towards how do we support growing sustainable businesses and lifting up low wage workers um, and making sure that everybody knows their rights as workers and responsibilities as employers. That's a lot to do in a four year period. So kudos to you and all of your work. Um, as we look at this budget in front of us, the things that I'm going to be looking forward to hearing more about is how have we put into place um, our ongoing commitment to make sure that there's sustainable funding to prioritize both the internal and external support that we need for workers. So internal to your department, um, how are we supporting your team? Do you feel like you have sufficient resources? And externally, given that we have two audiences, businesses and uh, workers, uh, how, how have we um, sustained our commitment to uh, doing that outreach and education work? And given the potential um, downturn on the horizon um, and concern and frustration, I think both from workers and small businesses about the unknown uh, in our economy, well, well uh, unemployment is low. We know that there's a lot of uh, folks who are working in low wage jobs still. How are we? in this budget reflecting our priorities to lift up those low-wage workers, do the outreach, and support small businesses. So thank you for all the work that you've done in a very short period of time. And again, I'll note that we have city after city that reaches out to us to look at the Office of Labor Standards model and our outreach and collaborative effort with small businesses and um, with workers uh, and their advocacy organizations uh, to stand up their own Office of Labor Standards in their cities. So we should be proud of the ongoing conversations that other cities are having based on the work that we're doing here. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to the incredible team here, Madam Chair. Well, I'll show Council Member Bagshaw, since this is the Office of Labor Standards, I do want to remind everyone it's quarter to 12 and most people take lunch around noon, so maybe we get through this with <laughs> short questions and short answers. We're violating the rules, but uh, uh, maybe we have introductions at the table with Marty and Dwayne and then turn over to Karina. My name is Dwayne McLean. I am the Finance and Operations Manager at OLS. Marty Garfinkel, Director, OLS. 
Karina Bull, Council Central staff, assigned to assist council mem members in considering OLS's budget this year. And to build on Council Member Mosqueda's words, the work of OLS continues to grow. In 2020, they will be implementing five new labor standards, the Commuter Benefits Ordinance, and the four recently passed laws aiming to improve the working conditions of hotel workers. And also uh, a moment to center everyone in a unique budget process that exists for Office of Labor Standards. In 2017, legislation created an Office of Labor Standards Fund, and this fund was intended to guarantee funding for the office and also establish a particular budget process. The fund is supported by business license tax, and when and if that money is not sufficient, then the general fund will make up the difference. And the particular budget process is that the mayor's proposed budget reflects the what's called the annual minimum contribution that the executive believes is necessary to sustain the core components of Office of Labor Standards work for enforcement and outreach. In 2019, the office added five positions through a combination of budget ads in the 2018 quarter two supplemental and also the 2019 budget. For 2020, the proposed budget does not request additional funding beyond standard cost changes, such as those that are necessary for annual wage increases. And we'll learn more about that from Marty and Duane. Thank you. Um, Welcome to I'll the table. I'll talk fast. I'm, I'm from Welcome New York. Welcome to the so. table. <laughs> What's that? I'll talk fast. Uh, the first slide uh, gives some highlights and some of the policy issues that we're dealing with. First, I'd like to spend a moment talking about the Domestic Workers Ordinance, which, as all of you know, went into effect in July and really represents a sea change in the law. We're the only jurisdiction in the country uh, that applies the, these protections to domestic workers regardless of employment status. Um, and uh, outreach is particularly important in this area because it, the law applies to thousands of households who may uh, not know about the law and may not even consider themselves employers. So it is a subject of intense outreach work as we speak. Uh, the council supported a request for a dedicated outreach person on domestic workers. Uh, and that person is hard at work putting flyers in community centers, libraries, doing brochures and trainings, getting on listservs. And starting next week, we're going to have a bus ad campaign that will go on for three months. It will be up on three, 200 or so buses and sound transit uh, tr uh, vehicles to put the word out, increase awareness, put out our phone number so that we can get the information out to people. There's also a domestic worker standards board, also a trend setting uh, institution that has had five meetings, one retreat, they've appointed the ninth member, and are on, are, are on track to get out the work plan that's due in early 2020. And there are rules that are going to need to fill in the gaps of the law. Those rules, the proposed rules have been published, they're out for comment. Final rules will be in effect by the end of October, early November. So we're on track, it's a very challenging area. Uh, but we're confident we're going to get the information out to people so that uh, this new group of employers, so to speak, are aware of their obligations and that workers know their rights. Uh, moving to the commuter. I think Councilmember yes, Mosqueda sure. has a quick question. Thank you, Marty. And again, thank you for all the work that you and the Domestic Workers Standards Board are com compiling. Um, while rulemaking is ongoing, I just wanted to check in. Is there a template that is already available for potential employers and poten uh, or hiring entities and domestic workers that we should all be aware of? Uh, you know, for example, um, I'm yeah. very interested in the conversations we've been having around nannies and house cleaners, and a lot of folks don't consider themselves employers, but I would love to see a template of those um, documents if available, and we can help well, circulate. Well, we, yes, yes, we have some, we have flyers, we have a Q&A on our website. I think the brochure that's about to be published has gone through a robust process of review is going to address some of those questions. Um, so, yes, it's a multifaceted outreach approach that we're going to have to take. Commuter benefits, that goes into effect, as you know, in January 20, this, this coming January. Enforcement is not going to happen until the following year. 
Uh, we are underway with development of rules. They're, good, they're not going to be very extensive, but they're going to be some rules. We had our first stakeholder meeting, and we expect to have the rules in final by Thanksgiving. Um, and there will be questions about that, but we have a good long time before there's any enforcement at all, and the enforcement that we do have is, is quite uh, soft. There's a right to cure if uh, businesses are delayed in, in instituting uh, the requirements. Hotel workers, as all of you know, uh, uh, this council and the mayor's office have worked really hard on the four new laws, which bring our total uh, stable of laws to 11 ordinances. Um, uh, our office worked very intensively on the rules for I-124 and therefore worked with your staff very intensively on the development of these laws. Because we had rules under I-124, I that's going to help us in our development of the new rules, but there are going to be some differences. So we are now in the process of planning a rollout for stakeholder involvement uh, to get input on what those new rules can and should be. Most of the laws, most aspects of most of the laws, as you know, go into effect next July, and those rules will be in effect before then so people have the guidance they need. Uh, turning uh, to the misclassification resolution, this council in February passed a resolution asking OLS to focus on the very important issue of misclassification of workers as independent contractors and to work with LSAC. We're, it also requires a twice a year report. We're in the process of preparing that first report, but let me give you some quick highlights. We've worked with LSAC to develop a subcommittee on misclassification representing business and worker advocacy organizations, and they are in the process of coming up with some proposals that they're going to present. Because we believe the ideal and best uh, result is to have a statewide solution to this problem, we've been in close communication with OIR on state legislative strategies. We're also reviewing a very recently released report of the State Department of Commerce on independent contractors that was uh, funded, I believe, in the last legislative session or the one before it. And we're uh, reviewing that and uh, going to be able to be in a position to comment on it soon. Our enforcement team on, on occasion reviews cases that have misclassification issues. We've taken pains to make sure that our team are trained up on the current, very complex, very hard to apply economic realities test. We have an uh, a, uh, informational uh, document that's on our website that uh, educates the public, also educates our enforcement team, and we uh, work with that test on, on a somewhat frequent basis. There's a very significant uh, change that's happening at the state law level with regard to overtime. Why, why am I talking about a state law issue on overtime? We enforce overtime issues through the wage theft ordinance. And in this proposal, there's a going to be a significant change in what's called the salary basis test, which is the threshold under which workers become eligible for overtime. Currently, it's $23,000 a year. That's going to be raised to $80,000 a year under the proposed rule over seven years, which will mean many more salaried employees will become eligible for overtime. That has an impact on our office in two important ways. One is we are going to need to get the word out to employers to make sure uh, to the extent that LNI's outreach isn't sufficient, that they know that this is going to have an impact on their operations, and it's going to have an in impact on our enforcement, no doubt. So uh, look for that. We, uh, we don't, uh, I think the final rule is coming out at the end of the year, uh, and I've heard just rumor-wise that it will go into effect sometime mid-next year. If we turn to the next slide, quickly going to strategic priorities. I've already spoken about domestic workers and commuter benefits. I want to talk about outreach. I think our office, we're still coming out of our startup phase, uh, is now moving into the next era of outreach. And we have a, and that is going to be reflected in two th major changes. One is we're reorganizing our outreach team. It's small, but it has been a part of communications, and as we grow, we realize we really need a separate team that focuses on outreach planning, outreach development, 
getting the big picture and applying it to the small picture. Uh, and a big focus of that is going to be outreach to businesses. We currently do outreach to businesses in a variety of ways. We create written materials, we have Q&As, we respond to technical questions by businesses and their attorneys. We have social media, newsletters, trainings, webinars, a very robust language access program. Marty, we, um, can I interrupt here for a moment? Thank you for speeding along, but I know Council President Harrell has a question. Sure. So, Marty, on the outreach piece, um, I haven't seen the next slide, but outreach, do, do you know, and if you don't, it's fine, the percentage of your budget that is dedicated to outreach, is it broken down by percentage? Well, I, I can't give you the percentage, but I could tell you that uh, we get a, well, um, I'm told it's about 40 percent. <laughs> and a significant part of that outreach, and the 40 percent that Mr. McLean is referring to is the funds. Yeah. This community outreach and education fund and the business outreach and education fund comprises 40 percent of our budget. But we do, out, you know, our staff, which is covered by payroll, does outreach on top of that. So, so a lot of the outreach you do, it's my understanding, you use outside agencies Correct. to do the outreach for you. So some of it's in-house, some of it's out-house, and all of that is within the 40 percent. And is there a rough breakdown on how much is outsourced versus in-sourced? Forty percent is outsourced. Oh, it's all outsourced. Yeah. But I see. what I'm saying is it's 40 percent plus because our staff is doing outreach. We're doing trainings. We're doing webinars. We're... Uh, you know, so is that it, a sort of an RFP process where you're looking at certain agencies and you correct. Uh, award fact, them? Yeah. In fact, this is a great opportunity for, for me to give a plug to the COEF partners, the 18 community organizations, many of them you know of. They're great groups. They are going to be doing a showcase of their activities tomorrow in the Bertha Knight Landis room from 11 to 3. All of them will be there. They'll be talking about their innovative outreach and educational activities that they've been doing for the last two or three years. And so really would love it if you all and your staff would be willing to attend. The BOEF focuses on, uh, is comprised of 15 partners, which are primarily chambers of commerce owned and operated and uh, representing people of color and immigrants. Uh, and they do, they do targeted outreach into those communities, to, into the most marginalized businesses. And what I, what I would like to point out is we recognize that there is a segment of the small business community that is not targeted by the BOEF, because they're not the most marginalized small businesses, but they represent a lot of businesses with a lot of workers who don't have their own HR department and so forth. I mean, there's a challenge here. There are 54,000 businesses in Seattle with employees. Many of them are small businesses in that category. We can't be the HR department for everyone, but we recognize we need to do more in that section of small and small mid-sized businesses. And, you know, we've got four outreach people. Two of them are contract managers of the funds. One is dedicated to the domestic work ordinance, and we have one generalist. So it's a small staff, but we know we need to do more, and we, I want to point out a couple of things that we're already doing. One is... Before you go on? Yep. Uh, you invited us to come to your event tomorrow in Bertha Knight Landis. Very kind of you, but we're all going to be up here. Okay. So we've got <laughs> a, a full day tomorrow, both morning and afternoon. Okay. So okay. staff maybe, but don't be offended if we're not there. We, I, we won't be. Thank you. We, we, uh, are, I wanted to point out that we are meeting with and working with SBAC, the Small Business Advisory Council. They have some concerns about businesses not being fully educated on all the different very complex areas that we implement. And we are working with them and, and trying to get their input on how we can do better. Like I said, we have a, we're going to develop a, a subcommittee of LSAC just dedicated to outreach on businesses. Uh, we work with FAS all the time. In fact, as we speak, we've created an insert. We've done this before. We're doing it again in the business registration packets that go out to thousands of businesses every year. We have an insert giving a review, a reminder, the new minimum wage, our contact information, and so forth. We mail out workplace posters to every business in the city. 
And we are developing coordinating approaches with OED because we recognize that a lot of these businesses don't just want a Q&A. They actually want tools that they can use, an Excel spreadsheet, a, uh, a legal advisor. And so we are working with, Bobby and I have met several times, we are working to try to give the actual tools that the businesses need because just talking at people just sometimes doesn't work for <laughs> folks, particularly, you know, who don't, don't have a legal background. Well done. Thank you. And Councilmember Herbold. Just a quick note that I really appreciate uh, this emphasis um, as well as um, the emphasis that you referenced earlier as it relates to um, the obligation of OLS to do enhanced um, education outreach to businesses, spe uh, specifically in those cases that OLS is enforcing state law. Uh, appreciate that that's called out as a priority. Um, earlier this year, um, OLS began um, enforcing um, uh, state law, specifically as it relates to the disclosure requirements around um, um, around um, uh, service charges, and some of our um, some of our high road employers in the city um, were um, uh, fined under um, that law. And um, some of these folks are people who are on the front lines fighting for minimum wage and paid sick and safe leave, um, and they're folks who um, want to go above and beyond in following the law. And this was an example where, um, as I understood it, um, uh, it was a, a, an issue of not knowing what the law is. Um, and um, I think I, I appreciate OLS's recognition that when we're enforcing the state's law, we have an extra obligation to not just assume that the state is doing a good job of getting the word out, but that we ought to play a role in it as well. So thanks. Okay. Thank you. The other thing I'll point out on, on the outreach is we are redesigning our website, which has not really been uh, redesigned since we started, and it needs to be. And we did an RET on it, and we are uh, hoping to get the new website up and running by early in the year. Um, unless there are more questions, there's a lot more to say, but unless there are more questions, I'll go to the next slide. Please. Uh, I want to touch on enforcement effectiveness and efficiencies. Uh, when I came on, we had a big backlog, and I talked that, about that last year, and because of recognizing that, this council agreed with the mayor's budget to give us additional positions in the enforcement area. We have, in, in, at the beginning of 2018, we had lots of investigations languishing from dating back to 2015 and 2016. And by now, we have cleaned up all but there's one that's about to be resolved from 2016. All the 2015 cases have been resolved. And we did that uh, by a number of steps. We focused on the problem. We trained people on how to resolve cases. And we also did some common sense approaches on scope of investigations. I, I think all of you know we do typically company-wide investigations, which exponentially increases the complexity of cases when one person comes to you. On the other hand, that gives a big impact and will, uh, in down the road, pay dividends in compliance. But sometimes we got too, too big and cases would just languish. And so we brought some common sense approaches to narrowing some of those cases and getting them resolved. And I think we've been successful. And I, I'm, I'm particularly proud that we have move to a place where we're approaching the benchmark that this council set uh, of 180 days for resolving cases. We're not there yet, but we're moving in that direction. Okay. And we've done all of that, I'm happy to say, without sacrificing effectiveness. And in our certification to this council that we presented and in our answers to the council's questions, we gave you a little chart that showed in 2017 there were total assessments of something over $527,000. In 2018, that went to over $2 million. And this year, we're on track to have, and most, all, almost all of that comes through settlements, we're on track to top $3 million. And many of those cases, most of those dollars, come from big cases involving large employers. We recently resolved a minimum wage case against an Arizona-based staffing company that was paying the wrong minimum wage for close to $700,000. and. Uh, you know, that, I think, speaks volumes about the effectiveness of our enforcement team. Uh, President Harrell has a question followed by Councilmember Mosqueda. 
So, uh, Marty, I'm, and I'm going to try to use this hearing just on the budget um, issues. I, I know you and I have been somewhat concerned the last year on some of the operational policy issues, so I don't want to get in that in this form. I think that would be inappropriate. But the question I have is somewhat policy-related because it relates to budget. And in all of this, and congratulations recently, too, I read about the uh, Jack in the Box settlement that I think affected almost 600 workers for a pretty large seven hundred seventy-two thousand. So that was secure, secure scheduling. scheduling yeah. uh, the question I have is, is um, I understand the process that you're describing and how disputes and resolutions are um, settled, it's my understanding on the procedures that there's really not a mandatory uh, mediation process that typically your department are uh, mediating directly or trying to settle directly with the employer and that process and then if it's not reached there it goes to the hearing examiner that's my understanding and my question is if there were uh, if there were a mediation a formal mediation process using an impartial mediator on these disputes perhaps one such that particularly for the smaller businesses in particular not some of the the, 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 the big the big ones but the smaller ones do you think that would result in some administrative savings in the process, staff time, uh, resource utilization, if, if, a, if a formal mediation process were put in place? I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I, hadn't, I haven't considered that. I've been involved mm -hmm. in my previous life in many mediations, and I know they can be very effective in certain cases. Uh, there is a cost involved, um, and there uh, there is the potential, in some cases, for delay in scheduling them and, and so forth. Um, and certainly, an, it's, a, it's a topic that I'm happy to think about more and give you a more considered response. I appreciate that. I, I'm getting a lot of one of your and I, one of your strategic priorities that I deeply appreciate is enhanced support of the business community, and I'm hearing that from them. I asked, uh, in, in all fairness, I asked the hearing examiner the same question that the hearing examiner does not have the authority under existing city law to mandate mediation. And yeah. I asked the hearing examiner, would that make sense, would that be a tool that he would be interested in? He's doing similar research as at all. I thought, right. much like the court system that can mandate mediation and rules require mediation under, under a certain threshold, why wouldn't the city, both in the department level and the hearing examiner, have that same process? So that's something I'm exploring, and so I'd be curious to talk to you off record about that. Thank you right. very much. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Mosqueda, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to call out for our colleagues' uh, awareness as well. Um, when the director talks about doing the industry investigations or strategic enforcement that allow us to do uh, an in-depth analysis of whether or not, for example, wage theft has occurred or if people aren't getting access to secure scheduling. That's also a cost savings measure. And I think it's important for us to know that um, we are doing some innovative work that the state of Washington, Labor and Industries, only wishes they had the capacity to do. Uh, in Labor and Industries directive, it says that they must investigate every single case. And it does give a director's charge to be able to do these company-wide investigations. But because of a lack of resources, they haven't been able to do that to the extent they want to. So I think this is another good example of where the type of investments that we're making in strategic enforcement through a director's charge really do allow for us to be more efficient and I appreciate that under the direction of um, Director Garfinkel we have been more efficient he said we have to be um, more uh, apply a more common-sense approach so that we weren't totally using up staff time but we're thinking about how we use that tool so to me it means more individuals are getting the wages that they're owed in their pocket and also to the extent that there's any revenue impact on the city which is the same argument we made to the state we're losing tax dollars when people aren't being paid appropriately so I think it does help us as a city as well ensure greater efficiency and equity among businesses so that the guy down the street isn't um, undercutting uh, the business of the high road employer as we talk about um, by not paying taxes or not paying the wages owed so it's an efficiency measure and I just wanted to lift that element up because it's um, it is an innovative policy approach great thank you and I'm glad you mentioned strategic enforcement I mean it, people use that term in a lot of different ways the way I think of it is how do we have impact on high priority <coughs> industries industries where we know there are 
low-income workers who are subject to workplace abuses, and particularly in, uh, in both in, in areas where we're not getting complaints. The one, uh, one th uh, fact you may or may not be aware of is, unlike some other cities we hear from national experts, we get a lot of complaints, including complaints from high-priority industries. So if we have a complaint from our high-priority industry, the question is not so much do we need a director's charge, because we have a, a complaint from a business in that industry, but how do we amplify and help educate that business sector? And we do that in a number of ways. We try to reach out and work with community partners who have trusted relationships with the workers. We also have a media strategy to highlight that information. You notice the press releases we put out. That's for the purpose of amplifying the message, because it is commonly understood by the best experts in this area that deterrence is an important part of that process. Uh, but we're also created, and it's on the slide, the Strategic Enforcement Coordinating Committee, which is to have kind of an overall look at the office and our enforcement work to see if there are gaps in what we're doing. And we uh, ha are doing this very intentionally and I think thoughtfully because if there's going to be director's charges, the business who's the subject of that is going to want to know why did you pick us? And we need to do our homework before we do that. Um, and we are doing that homework. We are uh, actually on in the early stages of a strategic campaign involving community partners. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to mention the in sector right now, but it's we're going to do this in a thoughtful way. It's going to be a two or three year campaign, and it's going to have an impact on an industry where we find we're not getting complaints and where we know from available data there are workplace violations. The last thing I'll say very quickly is, and I appreciate uh, Council, Mas uh, Council Member Mosqueda mentioning it at the beginning, we are, and we can all take credit for this, seen as a national leader. Uh, we are viewed across the country as the place to call to find out how do you do this. And we get these calls from cities that are thinking of doing it and from cities who have just started doing it. We're not the only ones. I mean, San Francisco's out there and New York is out there too, but we're right there. And it's one of the reasons the Center for Law and Poli Social Policy, CLASP, uh, is asking us to host, and we will be hosting in the fall, a national conference bringing together many of these wage enforcement agencies. And one of the things I look forward to uh, the agent uh, OLS doing is working more and collaborating more with some of these leaders around the country to grow together and to develop the best practices together because many of the companies that may be at issue here are national companies and so sometimes you really need to think of it on a national level. Um, unless there are any other questions, I would like to turn this over to our finance manager, Duane McLean. Thank you. Oh. Looks like Councilmember Gonzalez. Um, just one question. It has, it's not highlighted in um, your uh, presentation or the, the numbers. So before you got there, I thought I'd, I'd take an opportunity to ask the question. This is in um, response to some of the questions that Council Central staff um, asked uh, sort of as pre-budget questions, and it's around language access. So, of course, this is something that I continue to talk about and um, and highlight as a need for uh, the city to, um, <laughs> to, to grow and expand in this space. And I know that the Office of Labor Standards really does uh, approach the issues of language access with intentionality, and for that, I'm grateful. I'm looking at how much uh, money uh, was spent in 2018 and 2019 as it relates to translation and interpretation services. Um, it looks like over the last 20 months, there's been you know, a little over $48,000 uh, spent on language access related to each one of these uh, labor standards that, that exists. And the 2020 budget uh, includes $25,000 for language access work. So I'm just hoping you can um, uh, um, talk to me a little bit about um, the adequacy of the $25,000 for language access work and uh, how you expect to meet the um, multilingual needs of the individuals that you interact with, frankly, both on the business um, side and on the worker side. 
Okay. Um, well, we plan to work within our means. Um, <laughs> but it is, I, I will say that it's, it's a continuing challenge. Yeah. Um, and I, I appreciate you highlighting it because we, in our ordinances, and I appreciate this, it is mandated right. that we do this. And we take that seriously. But what it means in, in operations is if we have, say, an investigation that's completed and a notice has to go up to inform the workers, and it's in a language that we don't typically translate into, we will translate into it. And when we do it, we just don't rely on the professional translator. We have community reviewers that we hire to make sure that they're culturally sensitive translations. So it is a robust pro pro project, and it is a citywide issue. Uh, we're not the only ones dealing with this. So, um, and there's staff that work on this too. That's not reflected by the out-of-pocket. So it is a continuing issue. We work within our means, we, we make it happen. We do what needs to be done. Let me put it that way. But I invite all partners, all policymakers, to get together to figure this out in the long term, because I hear this from other departments as well. It is an issue that the city as a whole needs to deal with, and I've been talking about it ever since I got here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think um, I've, I've also been harping on this since I've got here, so I think we are on the same, um, page here, I, I, you know, this language access issue continues to come up. I think that it presents itself in the context of labor standards, uh, and, and this is also probably true for um, other enforcement type agencies in a very different way, where I think the, the, um, the, the risk uh, associated with not uh, fully funding language access for enforcement specific agencies is pretty significant in terms <laughs> of um, in terms of a policy position that effectively we're okay being okay um, in, in that space as it relates to people who might not have English language proficiency. Um, I'm just a little concerned that the $25,000 isn't enough um, in terms of the scale of labor standards work that we're doing and would really uh, appreciate the opportunity to identify this as an, an issue of concern for me as the council continues to um, work through uh, our budget process here. Um, I, perhaps getting a little bit more granular detail from you, uh, Marty, in terms of what $25,000 actually buys us um, as it relates to each one of these things, interpretation versus translation. And then uh, I know that we have been in conversations around language premiums for staff who are current city staff that are um, effectively being required to do interpretation and translation services because that's the only infrastructure we have. I think we should take into consideration what that cost is as well to our uh, to OLS in this context. But again, I think this is a really important uh, thing for us to prioritize um, in, in, this, in this agency. We just finished passing the hotel worker um, bills a significant portion of those workers are non-English speakers, so I, I don't expect that the need for translation, interpretation, and language access as a whole is going to go away. And I want to make sure that we are um, giving it a fair shot, just like we give yeah. English and a fair shot. I will say, we'll take another look at that budget line uh, and see what we can do about that. Huh? Okay. I, I do. I do that, appreciate but. that you all are doing what you can within the means that you have. I, I recognize that we have limited resources, but there's an inherent inequity there that I know. I'm preaching to the choir here that um, you know we don't we don't have to pay for English services, which means that people who speak English are inherently structurally able to access these services in a more um, equitable, free way and. Um, and that's just not the population that we're primarily serving when we're talking about labor standards. It is part of the population, but um, but it isn't a whole picture. So uh, appreciate the ongoing conversation and an opportunity to highlight that. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thanks. With that, I'm going to turn Hi, it over Dwayne. to Mr. McLean. All right. I'll be real quick. Um, thank you, Marty. As Karina mentioned at the beginning uh, of the presentation, the mayor's budget does not call for call for any more money to be appropriated to OLS in 2020, with the exception of the 4% increase due to citywide allocation costs. Um, 2019, there was a big, 
was a big growth year for us due to the five positions Karina again mentioned. Um, three came from the Q2 supplemental in 2018 and two at the beginning of 2019. And then in 2018, that's when we became kind of fully staffed in OLS and we used majority of the funds that were appropriated to us. And in 2017, um, those are just our expenditures as we were ramping up the office. So that's all I have as far as our budget. Marty, do you? No, thank you. And that's any questions? All we have. Well done, Mr. McLean. Well done. <laughs> I think Council President Harrell would say that's leadership. Um, <laughs> Uh, just a quick thank you to all of you, and I also want to acknowledge my council colleagues, Juarez, Mosqueda, O'Brien, Council President Harrell, Gonzalez, Herbold, and Pacheco for being here for almost three hours, and appreciate everybody's attention, asking good questions, and all of you at the table, thanks for your help. Karina, it's great to have you. I bet, Marty, you still rue the day that we stole her, but we're happy to have her. Um, so thank you, Council Central staff, Allison from my office for organizing this, Tom, and Dwayne, um, very much, Marty, for thank being you. here, and Ben, thank you. And we'll see you um, at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We will have public comment after it, and we will hear from Human Services Department, Office of Housing, and Deal. Thank Thanks, everybody. So this, we're now recessed until 2 p.m. Thanks, Josh, for being here the whole time.